Hi, I'm Andy Powell. Welcome to The Purpose Project. All topics are fair game. I hope you enjoy. All right, Dr. Torsten Stein. Yes. Welcome to The Purpose Project. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for making the trek. Nice. I appreciate it. So this is your book, Head and Shoulders Above the Rest. Yes. And uh, It would make sense if you would see me standing. That would make way more sense. Yeah, because you, you are seven foot two. Seven foot two, yes. And you're the tallest chiropractor. Guess the world's tallest chiropractor. Oh. So that's what my website says, world, world's tallest chiropractor.com. So... And it's probably true. And you're waiting for somebody to reach out and say, no, I'm taller <laughs> and I'm a chiropractor. But you haven't found it yet. No. <laughs> you know, actually, a long time ago when I was in school, I met a guy and he said, hey, you know what? When you graduate, you're probably going to be the world's tallest chiropractor, which if you're seven two, you're probably the most, world's tallest anything generally. Yeah. And he says, there's a guy in California and he's the world's tallest chiropractor. I'm like, no way. And I figured, and this is like before... I don't think the guy even had a website. And then totally unrelated, a year later, somebody comes up to me in New Jersey and he gives me a business card of that guy and says, you were like, like this. And it's the world's tallest chiropractor. So I send him a letter because back in the day you send letters. I'm, and, uh, I'm you know, taking your position over. <laughs> and I, I, was just, I was just joking. And I'm like, you know what? I'm seven foot two and how tall are you? He just didn't say it. And he was like 6'10". He said, you know, I have three boys and they're all chiropractors and they're already tall, but none of them passed me so i'm gladly giving you my sign when you know when the time comes i i never got it or wanted it but it was just a funny thing you know please, please send me your resignation <laughs> that's right <laughs> so have you ever met anybody taller than you oh yeah i mean how much not, taller i mean not many but are um, you the short one in your family or <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the tallest in my family so my dad was six four and my mom was six foot and then I was the first boy, and then my sec my my first brother, my second brother, basically, well, first one after me, second he's kid, six yeah. Four, yeah, second kid, he's he's six foot nine, Gerald. Okay. And then my mom passed away, my dad remarried, and I have another brother, and he lives in Anthem actually, and he's he's so he's my half brother, and he's he's only six five. Okay. So the runt. Yes, I know. I know. I <laughs> so, let him know it too. What? Yes. <laughs> so, do you have grandparents or, or yeah. great grandparents that are really tall? Not super tall. I mean, my mom being six foot, that was pretty tall, and my dad six four. So that was a you know, he's like in every company picture, he would be the one sticking out all the way in the back. Yeah, so. six six four is fairly tall. Yes. There's um, I'm wondering wh where the the height comes from if it's not. Oh, spinach? Genetic. <laughs> I don't know. It shows my age that I remember Popeye videos. Oh, no, stuff, I, know, so, yeah. I know Popeye. Popeye, yeah. right, and stuff. So, yeah. I, I don't know. You know, I mean, like, my brother, six foot nine, that's not short either. And then yeah. even my half-brother, right, like, six, four, six, five. Yeah, did you tall. happen to grow up in the Redwoods, this giant sequoia forest or anything? I wish. No, oh, I grew up that... in Berlin. Which yeah. Is, you know, but, but coming back to the question, did I ever meet somebody... So in, in basketball, I played against a few guys who were a few inches taller, seven four, which is a... So actually one of them, he is a... Um, I played college basketball against him, and he is now my patient still. And it's, it's awkward for me to see somebody who is taller or even just remotely the same. It's like I'm not used to looking straight ahead. I'm always looking down. So for yeah. me, that's totally normal. And if I have, even like a six foot seven or six foot eight guy, in my mind, I'm thinking, whoa, that guy's pretty tall. Yeah. And then I realize, wow, that guy goes to my nose. So, <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, yeah. Compared to the rest of us short yeah, people. Yeah, I know. I know. Gnarly, man. <laughs> well, that went, how, uh, how old were you when you got to seven foot or seven foot two? Um, I think I started college in the 80s. And I think I started at seven foot one. So I must have still grown another half inch or so. Cool. So, or maybe I was already seven, one and a half or so, but around that time. So I kind of grew quite a bit. I was um, 23 inches tall when I was born. Okay. So that's a decent size, yeah. but not super. And I was 10 feet, uh, 10, 10 pounds, 10 feet, <laughs> 10, 10 feet. pounds. Yeah. So, so that's, that's a decent, good. I was a good baby, I was told. 
Yeah. So um, my aunt told me, you know, I was like the favorite baby because people are normally you have a tiny baby. They're like, oh, I'm going to break it. Yeah. They would see me, they're like, and that's throw him in the air. Yeah. He seems sturdy. <laughs> He's pretty durable. <laughs> it's a durable baby. So I was a popular baby, I, I was told. Yeah. Popular, maybe. Hmm. So you're a chiropractor. Yeah. What made you want to become a chiropractor? I, let, let me tell you that a little bit. So me being super tall, I remember the first time I had back pain, I was probably around maybe 13, 14. I remember I was six foot seven at 14, which is pretty tall. And I weighed less than 130. So I was oh, wow. skinny. Yeah. And I had poor posture. My mattress wasn't... Now, back then, we didn't know about good mattresses. You know, just, that's the mattress you have. You lay in it, and there you go. And I would sometimes have, have lower back pain, and my parents sent me to a medical doctor, a nice person, and they said, well, we need to inject some painkiller into it. Then we need to um, put some heat lamp on it, putting heat on inflammation, not ideal, but they thought it was a muscle thing. Mm. And But the one thing that she did, which, which was actually good, is she realized, hey, you know what? You need to, you know, so skinny. I mean, <clears throat> the biggest part of my arm was my elbow. <laughs> oh, so wow. she's like, you know, you need to put some weight on, maybe some muscle. And I, I and I wanted to. And she said, you know, we need to make you stronger. I'm, we want to send you to physical therapy. And, and in hindsight, the exercises we did there, they were actually really good. A lot of plank holding exercises. Unfortunately, I was really weak. Mm. And I hated going. And, and it, was, it was actually kind of funny. So you... So you can imagine that you're, you're 14 years old and you're driving, I'm riding my bike after school to the physical therapy place. And winter time, so it's, you're miserable in Germany. It's cold, you've got gloves on, your nose is running. And you walk into that physical therapy place and it's one gigantic room and there's mats all over the floor. So mm -hmm. there's like a therapist and a person working here and there's somebody else here. So they're all there. And they can all hear you and you can hear them. There's no privacy and it's just all exercises. And and in hindsight, they were really good, but I just, I, I didn't like it. So you walk in and you know, at, at 14, you're not, a, you're not a boy anymore, but you're not a man yet. So you're kind of like in between and you're like, just, you don't feel good in your skin. And I'm, I'm, I'm hurting, I'm hunching over. And, and the first thing is I, I walk in and this lady, and I, I don't know her name, but it was probably something like Brunhilde. And she just, she's like, boots <laughs> off. I'm like, oh, okay, put your stuff there. And I thought, gosh, this is, this is, this is not fun. And I have to do all these exercises. And there's some, there's some young girls who are working out too, which back then when I was 14, I was trying to impress them. But then Brunhilde would constantly say, hey, you're so weak. I'm like, <laughs> like, can you like dial that down a little bit? <laughs> like, there's some other 14 year olds. And I think I'm, I may want to talk to them. But not anymore since yeah. you told them I'm so weak. <laughs> she ruined so, the chances. <laughs> totally. And I hated it. And, and you know, in hindsight, like now, if, if that would be me, if I could travel back in time, I would go back and I'd be like, I'm going to crush that exercise. I will practice that at home. And if you will not have the satisfaction to say that I'm weak, I will hold that plank until my back explodes. I don't care. But back then, I didn't. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want to do this. So after 10 sessions, she says, well, I think you need to go back to your medical doctor and ask for 10 more. I'm like, oh no. Yeah. I just, that my goal was 10 and now I have to do another 10. This, this is, I said, I'll do anything. By mm -hmm. the end of 10 sessions, had you made any noticeable improvement? I don't know, maybe. Yeah. I don't know. She thought she did, I didn't, I don't know how they, I mean, it, I mean, my back wasn't hurting all the time. It wasn't like that I would feel 50% better. It would sometimes hurt, sometimes it wouldn't hurt. And she says, well, and, and you, I know I was improving in strength, and I knew I was able to hold the plank longer, but I don't know. So she determined, determined you need to you get some more. And, and I'm, I'm pleading with her. I'm like, can I write a paper? I'll do anything not to. I said, can I write a paper, like in school? And she's like, no, I don't need a paper. I, I said, I'll do anything so I don't have to come back. And, and like now I would just wouldn't go back, like we're adults. But back yeah. then, she's like, well, you got to come back, otherwise I call back your parents. I'm like, oh. Okay, well then I... I have to and, do it. I have to do it. And, and she says, well, why don't we do this? You pick a sport. If you do a sport, another a different sport, they'll build muscle for you and you're going to be good. So I had to go into her office, sitting like the way you and I are sitting now. 
And she says, so, I gotta pick a sport. You like one? I'm like, I don't know, no. <laughs> she said, how about soccer? I'm like, I'm not, no. I'm not fast, I'm not coordinated. I'm... She said, how about handball? I'm like, nah, I don't know, too brutal. My, my dad played that, I'm like, nah. What is that, is that like rugby? No, it's like, you have it in the Olympics. You have a small ball and you just basically dribble it and you throw it and it's like, I don't know. They show it in the Olympics. Okay. So it's coming up soon. Is it a team sport? Yeah, it's a team sport okay. and stuff. But you get grabbed and you fall on the floor and oh. I was weak. You have to be tall for that. But that was popular back then in Germany. And she said, volleyball. And I'm like, you know, I've, I've, I've done that in school a few times. She said, you know, that'll probably be beneficial if you're taller than the net. And, and she said, wait, I got one basketball I'm like is that the one with the rim and the net it wasn't popular in Germany at all okay and she said you know I think for that you should be tall are you maybe interested in that I'm like sound, sound, yeah okay I'll, I'll do that one <clears throat> so she gives me a phone number she's like this is my ex-boyfriend he's a basketball coach you have to go there if you don't call him I'll find out I'll call your parents I'm like no I'll, 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 I'll do it I'm like I'll do anything <laughs> So I, give me, give me a second here. Yeah. <laughs> so there was no basketball in schools at the time there. They, they had it, like, like maybe every every fifth session there would be a little basketball, but they would kind of, all right, I guess. And there would be like one guy who, who, who knew how to play and then the other people just standing around. Okay. And that guy would score four points and the rest would do zero. And it <clears throat> wasn't good. But... So I called the coach and I'm like, hey, I'm six, six foot seven. And he's like, how tall, how old, 14? He's like, I think I'm interested in you. So in Germany, you generally play, don't play sports, at least back in the day, that you don't play sports in, in high school. So you go to a club team. So if you're interested in playing soccer or so, you go to a local club team and there are club teams all over and you go to the closest one. So this one wasn't the closest. It was 45 minutes by bike and but I had to go there. So I'm finding my best friend, Reiner. Uh, Reiner and I, I'm like, hey, you gotta come with me. I, don't, I have to go to basketball, but I really don't wanna go by myself. I don't think I'm gonna be good at it. <clears throat> so he, him and I, we, we ride over to the first practice together and, and get, get into the gym. And it was after the season. So I see there were like maybe six or seven guys. Two of them are six foot seven, like me. Never met, at that time, I never met anybody six foot seven. And there were two of them. And the coach comes up. He's like, oh, yeah, pretty, pretty tall. Can you play? I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> he's like, well, that's cool. And he calls me Tom. <clears throat> and he's like, oh, Tom, can you play? And I, I correct him. I'm like, Torsten. He's like, oh, he calls me Tom again. And and so he's like, well, let's practice a little bit. And so practice starts and you know, we have to run. And I'm already right away winded. <clears throat> I'm like, Phew. But also, I had to ride 45 minutes my bike there. So yeah. maybe that, and so I'm like, it's exhausting. <clears throat> and then he's like, okay, well, let's dribble. And sure enough, every single time I dribble it, I'm hitting my foot. And the oh, ball yeah. shoots out. And, and he's like, Tom, that, that wasn't good. I'm thinking, I'm going to even correct him. At least I want him to remember that that guy, Tom, is not good. <laughs> I didn't even mind that he didn't know my name. So after the, after the first practice, he says, you know what? I don't really need you in the team, which is kind of crazy, right? <laughs> I don't need you in the team. And, and and I didn't care. Like I didn't I actually didn't even want to play. Yeah. I just all I wanted is I wanted I didn't want to have to go physical therapy. And my dad thought it'd be a cool thing to play a little basketball. I said, I don't want to play any games. I just wanna just go here once or twice a week, practice a little bit, have some fun, and that's it. What did you want to do with your time as a kid? No any goals. Anything else? I don't I don't, I don't remember. I don't yeah. remember. I mean, at some point I wanted to be Batman, but well, Batman. and then astronaut because I saw the moon landing. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, but that was it. I didn't have a real goal. You know, and I wasn't too great in school. I just wasn't interested. Yeah. You know, and I, I wanted to hang out with my friends and stuff and we would ride our bikes and I don't know what we did. Yeah. Nothing bad. Just, just we, you weren't interested in sports. Wasn't really. Huh? Yeah. So, so then, so he sends me to the second team. He's like, you know what? You don't really have the skills, which I didn't. He said, so, um, We'll, 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 we'll put you into the second team and, and they practice once a week on a Thursday. And, and literally that's the, that was the, the team that like, there were all the rejects, right? That was me hunching over. I was like some little dude and I was like a chunky guy. And so they weren't really, a, they didn't make a good team. 
And the coach wasn't interested in coaching. So there was a coach who was a student and he would just sit on the side line and write a paper. And he would just kind of go, all right, uh, I don't know, just try to dribble with your right hand. And all right, and good, and then turn the other way. And he write this paper. Now everybody tried to do the left hand and he would just like try to block us out so he could write papers and stuff. But that was a kid and that's a reason why I want to tell you. So that was this kid, Tim. And that guy had real passion for, for basketball. He was like, man, I'm, I love basketball. So, so until then, I don't think I ever saw a basketball game. I never watched one. I was none, none of, on TV. But Tim's parents had a, a, a decoder for AFN TV. That's American Forces Network Television. Mm -hmm. And you could, with that, you could watch a basketball game live. Now, he invited me, but I would have been at 2 in the morning. So there's no way my parents would have let me leave it to watch a basketball game at two in the morning. So I, I never watched one. So when we came to practice, Tim would tell me about a game he watched and he described it and it was fantastic. He would come up to me and say, by the way, do you know that those basketball players in the United States, they're very popular. They make real money. Some of them walk around with fur coats. This is in the seventies, by the way, and yeah. stuff and stuff. And he's like, girls like those guys. I'm like, really? Well, that's, that'd be cool. <laughs> I'm like, really? He's like, oh, that's totally. And he would describe some. He's like, well, this guy here, his name is Dr. J. And I remember, I'm like, Dr. J, is he a real doctor? He's like, well, must be. He, they say he's operating on the court. I'm like, that sounds legit. I mean, <laughs> what? I mean we don't know anything. We're just like, that's my, that makes sense. That's yeah, I mean, he operates on the court. That's what they said. So I'm like, well, yeah, that's, wow. wonder how he does surgery there. Yeah. Like, this must be a genius and stuff. <laughs> so he would show me a move. He's like, check this move out. And he would show it to me. And then he's like, practice that. When we're supposed to do dribble, do that move. And I just stand there and I try to do that move. And then he said later on, at the end, we would always have a little scrimmage. And Tim would say, I'm going to give you that ball. And I'm, I want you to do that thing. I'm like, okay. So he'd throw me the ball. All the opponents were like down to here and I'd do the thing. And at some point, the coach said, you know, I don't think you really belong here. But then I was like 6'8 or 6'9. He's like, you know, I really belong here. And then he brought me back to the sent me back to the first team. Nice. So, but the cool thing is that Tim had these, and that's, that's why I want to share it because it's, um, it's a good lesson. So at that time, I didn't really have anything going for me, right? I wasn't a cool guy. I wasn't really popular. I, I wasn't great in school. I, I, I didn't have a job. So it wasn't like I had cool things. So, so really, just, uh, I, wasn't, I was just a regular guy. And I'm um, probably disappointing with my parents often because my grades weren't that great. Mm -hmm. And this guy, Tim, often I would walk, like I would walk home with him. He, he lived on the way to, to our house. And then from there, I would ride the rest of the way with my bike. And Tim would tell me, he's like, man, you're getting better. One day people will pay to see you play. I'm like, I don't think so. He's like, no, trust me. You will play in America. I'm like, really? No, no. I could. But he believed in me, right? And it was really motivating. It's kind of like if you have somebody who, you know, somebody who draws, Nice. Or, or something, or just somebody plays the piano or something, you know, to give them some motivation, to give them some, because I was totally motivated. I mean, I couldn't wait until we practiced again. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I wish I could actually contact this guy. I don't know his last name. So it, it worked and, though. Yeah, right. And so I, I wish I could send him my book and call him and go like, hey, Tim, remember you gave me all this positive feedback? Well, you were it right. worked, right? Yeah. And stuff. So that's kind of, so it's a nice thing. Take the, Take your time to motivate people and, and see something in them and kind of yeah, give them encouragement. It's a good thing. Okay. So then how did your basketball career progress until you got injured, right? That's... Mm. I was kind of injured all the time. So yeah, contrary to what this um, Brunhilde lady said, basketball does not fix your back. So actually it's a lot of jumping and pounding and yeah. it doesn't help, you know, so the pain goes away. And back then I had no clue what the pain, where the pain could come from. I literally had no idea. I, but sometimes it would hurt, sometimes it wouldn't hurt. Sometimes I would stretch and it would make it better, but sometimes it would make it worse. I had no idea. I was completely clueless and now I know what it is. But back then, literally had no idea. Very frustrating and it could hit at any time. So you could warm up and bend forward to pick up a ball and you suddenly go to the, down to the ground going, oh my gosh, I can't do anything. And then you're hoping you get an injection so you can play. Yeah. And But sometimes I'll be good for a whole week. I'm like, oh, I guess, and I don't know, you know, but there's a lot of strain on your body when you jump. And apparently, well, we'll get into it a little bit later, but when, once you, those joints wear down, those discs, 
it's easier and easier to get injured. That's why you sometimes have like an 80 year old who says, oh, there was a little draft on my neck and it threw out my back. Oh, wow. And, and you're thinking, well, that draft, I was in the same draft and it didn't happen on me because their spine is so worn down that it should have been fixed a long time ago. And that's how the, those, those, those problems happen. But yeah, so I played, I started playing basketball and then um, I, I, one of the t players in the team, he, he was from the United States. Phil. And Phil said, you know, you should play college basketball. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if I can. I don't know. I don't think I'm good enough. Because the only thing at that time I heard was like people like famous guys like Patrick Ewing, who are obviously <clears throat> superstars. I'm like, I'm not that good. He's like, well, you don't have to be that good, but you can, you can definitely play college basketball. And I, I said, well, how do I do that? Like now it's easy, right? I go online and uh, back then he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll make it happen. I, I talked to some people and then I got, got offers. I told my dad, I said, you know, when I graduated high school, I'd like to maybe study in the States. And he's like, why would you want to do that? <clears throat> because in school, in, in Germany, college is free. Okay. Well, free is, is, a, is the wrong word because it's, it's not really free because it's, you pay for it later on. But that's what young people see here, right there. They kind of go, Oh man, school is free. That'd be so cool. Well, it's, all, it's never free. You always have to pay for it. Yeah. And stuff. So, but I said, my dad's like, well, it's free college. Why don't you use it here? And, and but then schools actually called and they were very interested. And, and my dad, I think, realized, hey, this guy actually has some pretty good value. Coaches telling you that we've got brochures sent to you. So many of the German, <clears throat> many of the German universities, they don't look that great because they're government funded. So, um, some of them are covered in graffiti and they're just, they just don't look nice. And then suddenly <clears throat> you get a brochure from here and we, the, I got recruited by several schools. And suddenly they, they show a beautiful fountain and my dad is like, this looks pretty good. He said, you know, if they're going to give you a full scholarship, you should really take it. And, and so I, I visited a couple of schools and then I decided I picked one school it's called Fairley Dickinson University. And that's in New Jersey, um, Teaneck, New Jersey. So there was a Division One school. I picked New Jersey. I told Phil that I wanted to play in New Jersey because I wanted to. That's I wanted it to be the closest to Germany in case my dad ever wanted to come and watch me. Nice, right? In hindsight, I could have gone onto the West Coast or Hawaii or anywhere else, and he would have had to fly only a little bit longer. But my mindset is like, well, I want to be there. I think it'll be easier for him to fly there. And, yeah. and I liked it, you know, even though New Jersey is not known to be the nicest state. But I, I enjoyed it and I made great friends that I'm still in contact even now. And so that's how I started. Awesome. Awesome. So then it, in your, <clears throat> I guess at what point did you realize like, okay, well, this back pain is an issue and went to see a chiropractor? A long, long time after. Okay. So I, tr I literally tried everything else. So were you were you playing basketball all through college, and then did yeah. you go did you go further than that, or did you stop after college? So so what I <clears throat> I had a lot of low back issues in college too, and um, I think I visited. That's the first time I ever visited a chiropractor. Now also, there's about they say there's about two hundred kinds of chiropractic. So you can go to somebody and you're like. I didn't like it. Well, you didn't go to the right one. It's 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 that two hundred is a is a, a crazy number. Like if that would be like two types, you can you visit a few and you're like, oh, okay, I tried this one and I'll try the other one. But but they say it's two hundred. Can you know? so what, I mean, what would be the difference? Because in my understanding of chiropractic, what you're doing is you're just, you're manipulating joints and the spine, right, or the muscles around the spine so that it fixes the rest of the body. Well, so so you're trying to take the pressure of nerves. And, and you can do it in different ways. So there are some techniques, techniques where you don't even touch the body, the, the patient. You just wave the hand, your hands over it. Does it work? I don't know. <laughs> okay. I, mean, I was thinking, if that works, how are they going to... My, 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 de my first degree is in marketing. I was, I was thinking, how would, like if, I, if I fixed you up and, said, and you came home and you tell your, you know, your friend, say, that guy, he waved his hands over my back and it worked. Your friends, like they're going to be like, how is that going to work? So I, I, that never made sense to me. And I'm not saying it doesn't work. Well, you have to really look in what, what do you want to do with that? Like when people go, but it worked, what, what do you mean? Like, do you feel better? Did you 
feel satisfied. I, I know I had one patient, she came in, she used to see a chiropractor not too far from my, my old office. And she said, um, there were 10, there was one big room, there were 10 tables with face slots and you, you paid a monthly fee and you just laid down. And she, but you got greeted by the chiropractor. I don't know if it was a guy or a girl. And basically this guy gives you a hug and said, man, so nice to see you. And then he laid face down and they waved like a feather or something over their back and stuff. And after that, when you left, I think they gave you tea. Hmm. And, and I thought to myself, well, that does, how's that going to work? Yeah. Right? But, but they like, she liked it because she said, you know, I went in my lunch break and somebody says, hey, I'm really happy to see you. And they give you a hug. And there's a lot of people who, will never, get a, who never get a hug, right? So you yeah. give a hug and you lay face down for 30 minutes. I'm like, oh, you know, a 30 minute nap. Uh, so I don't mind. Somebody waves sounds great. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and at the end, they give you a free tea. I'll be back tomorrow. And I wouldn't call it chiropractic, but it would work. And and so you can say, well, I like this guy. This is a, sounds like a cool thing. Again, I, the definition of chiropractic is to remove interference to the nervous system. And if there is a is, is interference, and not just in, in the spine, it could be in, in the wrist or shoulder, etc. So if there's a misalignment, there's going to be inflammation and the body will not work properly. Could that apply to obesity too? Because, I mean, being overweight is interference to the nervous system. It can, yeah. <laughs> so first of all, there's no there's no overweight. It's always, you're too short. That's number one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you, can, you can see I have a different perspective and things. Yeah. <clears throat> but... Um, so the, I've had some people, so in generally, like I won't have people come in and say, I need to lose some weight and stuff because that's that really wouldn't be the place. But it has happened. I've had patients who had, car, it's not, no joke, they, they had car accidents. They got, their, they got whiplash. They got their neck messed up. And after that, their thyroid didn't work properly anymore. Really? Right? Because any, any nerve, the, the nervous system does control every organ or gland or muscle, etc., so if the thyroid doesn't get the right nerve supply, it is possible that the, ner- that the thyroid will now work less. And half a year, year later, they get di- diagnosed with hypothyroidism um, or something. And, and you can take pills and stuff for that. But so I've probably had one or two people maybe who, who said, hey, you know what? Ever since I've been coming here, I've been losing weight. But then often also, in addition, they feel better so they can walk more. And I tell people, you know, don't sit so much, start walking. Once you start walking, you feel better. Maybe you don't eat more. You probably eat less donuts and you eat more yeah. or something else, right? So it's, it's a combination of. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be really for obesity, but we'll get into it when we when we kind of see how how the whole body and stuff, the nervous system works. <clears throat> but but yeah, like um, so I was um, I grew up in Berlin and then I obviously moved here and have been in Arizona for a little over twenty years. H- have you looked into Berlin? Because I, I get a lot. Of, people talking to me about Berlin. No, not as much as I'd like. It's actually interesting and stuff. And you were there before the wall fell? Yes. So there, um, when you look at the history, like, so Berlin is, I'm in 1980s, it was 750 years old. So it's appra- approaching 800 years. So it's, it's, it's an old city. Mm-hmm. It's actually a gigantic city. And um, after World War II, Germany got divided into four parts, right? So they made actually two parts, right? So one part was the Allies, and that was the United States, France, and uh, Great Britain. And then the other part was the Soviet Union. And they split up Germany. In 1944, they had uh, some meeting, they're like, hey, when once Germany loses, we're going to split that up. And the the Soviet Union got the eastern part, which made sense because it was closest to them. But they had Berlin. Berlin was the capital of it, gigantic city, and that happened to be in East East Germany in that part. So I don't know how they negotiated it, but for some reason they said, "Well, you can't have the cool city too. You got you got this whole piece of land that you can't have the cool city." Yeah. And and the, and the Soviets were like, "Okay, I guess we'll split that up also into four parts, or basically two parts." So they had East and West Berlin, and then East Berlin was part of East Germany, and then West Berlin was part of West uh, West Berlin was part of West Germany, but it wasn't connected. So it was basically like a like, a, like you have to think of like a donut. <laughs> so it was surrounded. So then, um, 1948, the Soviets had a blockade; they didn't let any food into the city, and then um, 
the United States, and I think Great Britain and maybe France too, but de definitely the United States, they flew food in, in in, in, in the record amount of, I mean, they're just landing, unloading, and taking off again. And basically, this is the way that city then didn't, didn't give in, and they were able to keep their independence and stay West Berlin. Mm. My dad was there, and he... He told me he watched it. He said they called them ro um, raisin bombers. That was a, a thing because they were just food. Yeah. This is unloading. They were just like, I mean, there was one landing after another one. And because all the other, um, they, the, the Soviets didn't let any uh, trucks or trains through. So they did it all through air. <clears throat> and then at some point, the Soviets gave up. They're like, okay, well, the Americans kicking our butts. So. And you know how long they were doing that for? I don't know. I should know, but I actually don't know. Yeah, I'm curious if it was days or if it was months, because um, it probably no. wasn't more. I mean, I how know. long can you sustain people that way? I, I guess know. indefinitely if you have enough food to drop. I, I, I guess so. Right? I don't but, know. I should have read up on that. All I know is I, it was a great thing, and I saw many other. <clears throat> they, they, they have several of those old planes in Berlin, and they are, they call them the Raisin Bombers. And you've been told the story, but I never asked. How long? I should have probably should take a break and Google it, but otherwise, I don't. I don't know. But they, it was an impressive thing. So my dad was was born 1940. That must have been 48. So he was a little boy, and didn't have much food. He yeah. always told me when I didn't want to f eat my breakfast, lunch, or dinner. He's like, ah, when I was your age, I didn't have any food. So he we tell you that story about the raisin bomber again. I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm sure you, everybody heard those stories and stuff. But so that was 1948, and then. Um, East Germany was very different than West Germany. So they had a different system. So the West Germany is a system of, of capitalism just like here. And then East Germany was more, they tried to do it socialist. I don't know if you know how great socialism works, but it doesn't work so well. <laughs> no, <laughs> right? it, it doesn't. So the people living in East Germany also realized that it doesn't really work too well. It was just... In theory, it would work, but it just doesn't work with people, right? It's just like you don't get any reward for your work, and you. So in 1961, I think in August of 1961, East 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 Germany basically said, "You know what? We can't have all these people leaving our our country." So they suddenly, at night, put out barbed wire, and then they put barbed wire around the whole country. So it was a, a huge undertaking. And then once they had the barbed wire, they had people, bricklayers, and those bricklayers were putting out bricks and, and, and erecting a wall. East Germany put up posters, and I said, we are not erecting a wall. And then when the wall was finished, people were questioning it. <laughs> and, and that's one of the interesting things. <clears throat> it seems like the left uses words in a different way. They use words in a different way. They said, well... We didn't build a wall. And then people said, well, it seems it looks a lot like a wall. And I said, well, it's not a wall. It's an anti-fascist uh, protective border. Yeah. Oh, it looks like a wall. No, nope, yeah. you're wrong. They got, there's one guy I know calls those weasel words. <laughs> exactly. And, and I would say that they're not... That, they're not just using the word in a different way. They're lying. They're using oh, yeah. it to misinform, obviously. Yes, I was diplomatic. What's that? <laughs> I was very diplomatic, but yes, they're lying about it. <laughs> yeah. They're lying about it, <clears throat> and they created this insane, I would say a genius system of, of control. And, and, and that system, I bet you right now there's politicians who are saying, man, that system was amazing how they control people. I, you, you, have, you have no idea. It was unbelievable. They had one third of all people in that country. It turns out that they were spies. So one out of three people were spies. And not the cool spies with like James Bond with the suppressor. No, like the North Korea spies where you tell on your neighbor if they're yes. doing something that they Correct. shouldn't be. So, so how do you get it done? And I read a few books about it and I was really interested because interesting how they did it. So they would find, let's say they wanted to recruit you, right? And they would, they would find something that like, hey, you, you parked in a non-parking zone. And you're like, oops, sorry, is that fine? Uh, no. You're gonna lose your license, and you're like, "How? Wow! How am I gonna to get to work? Uh, you shouldn't have broken the law." Well, come to our office tomorrow, and we'll give you a solution. And then they say, "You know what? We need you to write a report about somebody when we call you, and with this, you can get your license back." So they take something from you, and they're giving it back to you, and you're like, 
okay. And, and they might say, hey, the next person who you interview, find out if he's against the government. Right. Right. Now, here's a trick. Because a normal person would say, okay, I'll do that. But in reality, you wouldn't. See, but they might send, they may send another spy. And my trick, my mission is to check if you're going to tell on me. Accountability. So, yes. So I would, I would give you, I would, I would test you. and say, I don't like this guy who's running everything. And, and, and you might not turn me in and now you're in trouble. Yeah. And so, so you have to turn me in. And, and, and can you imagine what that would do to people? You Division. Will, yes, and you will not, I don't I wouldn't want to talk to anybody. Yeah, about anything legitimate. Exactly, right? Yeah. So my, my friend, i just give you an, an idea. So they, they were all, they had all these spies and stuff. And, and my, my best friend who went with the, to the basketball co- practice for the first time, um, later on when the wall came down, he married a lady from East Germany. And then in the news, they said that people, um, many people had files on them. He's like, well, maybe there's a file on you. She's like, hey, I was a young girl at that time. I was a secretary. There's no file on me. He's like, well, let's just check anyway. So they go to this place where you can look up your files if there is one. And it turns out she had a file on her. And she's reading it. And it turned out that her best friend turned her in for something like smoking behind the dumpster or something, like something stupid. Minimal, yeah. Oh, yeah, right. But it, somebody had a file on her. So like somebody found one mistake and they're going to possibly one day would use it against you, right? And and that's incredible if you think about it, right? That, but so which side were you on? I was on the west side. You were western on the west side, side, yeah. So this wasn't going on on the no, west side? No, So So we were the free part. So West Berlin was free, mm-hmm. and there was a wall around it. And the wall, um, I looked it up recently. I think it was, a, it was about 100 miles long. So this is a long wall. I've also had some people say, hey, I'm... Um, there's a wall. Can't you just walk around it? No, it's connected. It's there's a begin, there's no beginning and end. This is all. So if you wanted to get to the other side of the wall, three ways of doing it. So first of all, it was just one wall. Like one wall is easy, right? I mean, the wall was I think it was about about fifteen feet tall, maybe. So 13, did, 14, 15. did people cross over? Like if you were in West Berlin, could yeah, so you, you go could, visit your friend in East could. Berlin? Yeah. So in the beginning, they completely blocked it up. So one day they woke up the next morning and people go, what is this? And they were like, you can't cross over. And you might be like, my wife is there. Like, well, tough luck. You can't cross through. And they, and they stopped it. So for I think for a year or so, you couldn't pop, visit. Pop, pop. Right. So some people, they tried to break through with a, with a truck. And they had some really interesting ways of escaping. I mean, my wife and I, we went to a... Berlin Wall Museum in Berlin, mm-hmm. and I was like, "Wow, that's that." Some of them did some really adventurous stuff with shooting an arrow over and then t- having a zip line and zip lining over the over the wall. Impressive, so, yeah, very impressive. I'm like, man, this is like stuff that you'd see in the movies. So it's pretty impressive. Some people dug tunnels and stuff, so it wasn't just one wall, right? So, so it was two walls, and that's the, that's the whole idea. So you have one wall that's like maybe 13, 14 feet. And you don't know what's behind it. So the first trick is, imagine you would be in, in East Germany. You want to you wanna leave, right? Mm-hmm. The first thing is you would, obviously, you can't, there's, none, there's no book that shows you how the wall is set up. So, and there was no internet before that, right? So you really didn't know what's, what's behind it. So in order to observe, you'd go there, and then they have these people, and that's, that's sp- the spies would literally go, what are you doing here? I've, I've never seen you here. Let me write down your license plate. And you're like, I, I don't know, I got lost. Well, I'm going to write down anyway. Because they would turn you in. Anybody who would look suspicious, they would turn you in. So you couldn't even approach the wall. It would be really, really hard. When you made it, but there was a, one wall, and then they had, um, had all kinds of stuff in between. They had splinter mines. Um, they had towers. And the, the tower guards, there was always two of them. And they had an order to shoot, right? So shoot to kill. Because, I'm like... These are people who want to leave your crappy country because it's not working, and and your job is to shoot people, right? That's to me. I'm like, it's not they're not invading. No, you're leaving them. You're basically creating a prison. It was North Korea again? Yeah, right, like that. They had um, lions with dogs, so that would be a dog on a on a chain. So they would, and they had, they had all kinds of, and they had um, what was called it. It was called um, Stalin grass. And there was basically spikes over. So if you walked over it and you suddenly have long spikes in your feet, that would slow you down and it would make it really hard for you to make it over the second wall. And and so they really wanted to stop you. 
And there were several cases, obviously, that people made it, they got shot, and that was in the news. But it was also a very effective tool. Like anybody in East Germany going, well, they just let you there, let you lay there and die. And people from West, West Berlin or West Germany would be like, there's somebody there, but you couldn't do anything. So that's a, a sad thing. I think a little mm. over 100 people tried, but I'm sure a, lot, a, lot, a few more would obviously would have tried, but, you know. Do you know if anybody actually made it past both walls? Well, they had some. They had some videos. There was a. Um, I think Disney had a video where the, the two families got together and they built a balloon. I forgot the name of the. It was actually a pretty good. One. It was a mm-hmm. based on a real story where people they build a balloon and then they they were lucky to make it over the wall. So that was actually a real story. So if so, if somebody makes it over both walls, right? Can't like if you're on the east side and you're mm-hmm. going to the free. Mm-hmm. place the west right if you make it over both walls yes. will guys from the east come and get you so i at at that war museum there was a uh, i was reading up on it there were a few important people who left and there were not regular common folk but they were like a politician or i don't know like a higher ranking border patrol agent who just left and then apparently once or twice, I don't know how many times, but they actually sent agents after you and kill them. Yeah. Right. And that one, but that came out after the wall came down in 1989. But before that, I'd never heard of that. But but basically there were three ways to you could leave East Germany. And was, one of them would be climb over the wall. The second one would be um, if you become like a political prisoner because you are, you know, you, know, you spoke out against the regime and they put you in prison. West Germany would find out about it and say, you know what, that guy, he's not really a criminal. Let, let us, how much you want for him? We'll buy him. And they're like, okay, well, we want this much money for him. Really? Yeah. But what then, incentive would West Germany have for buying somebody? They said that it's not, they Just said it was help. the right thing to do. But okay. then the East Germans, wow. they would say, well, if you want that guy, you got to get take those other two guys. And they're like, who are these two? Are they also political prisoners? Nope, they're murderers. All right, I guess we'll buy all three. And th- that's how they would do it. Wow. And sometimes they would have a guy who made it over the wall. And they say, you know what, as soon as, let's say, let's say you have to take a regular family. And there's usually it would be younger people. It's usually the highest chance of making it over that would be a man. Because they're fa- strong, etc. cetera. So the, let's say the man makes it over, he crosses. The wife would immediately be put in prison because she should have known about that. And then if you have a kid, the kid goes automatically into foster care. So then you go to the West German government and say, I'm, I made it and I want you to really buy my family. And they're like, well, let's get the process started. And that probably, I don't know how long it took, but they said it could take, could take a couple of years. Wow. And, and um, I don't know, like, see, my wife, she's always mad at me for some reason. Imagine she would have to go to jail for me for two years. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, man. I'd be like, oh, no. So you want us to buy her? Oh, no. <laughs> She's going to be really upset anyway. Yeah. And our teenage kid, well, they have stayed with foster people now for two years. And they're going to, they're indoctrinated. Oh, no. They're probably already used to it. Yeah. I'm free. You know, no, I'm just, just I want to just start over. Oh, man. <laughs> that, that was a bad joke. No, so, I know. <laughs> you would never do that. No. Never. But but that's how they would do it. So that, those were the two things. And then the third one, and that was actually the mind-blowing one. And I have a good story on that is... Once you turned, I think it was age 64 or 65, you had no value for the for East Germany because you retired. And then they let you go. So old Peter let old people go. Huh. And so my best friend Rainer, his family got divided in 1961 when the war came up. So there was suddenly a split in half. And I was there when his aunt and uncle finally both of them turned the required age, 64, 65. And they came over for the first time. And we were stupid teenagers, so we didn't really... I wish back then I would have been like, hey, this is so interesting, share some information with me. Yeah. But, you know, when you're a teenager, you're... Yeah, that's I was life. A dumb, I was a dummy. <laughs> they come into the house. So we are... Uh, my friends, uh, um, the, you know, he, stayed, he lived with his parents because we were teenagers. <clears throat> and they had a regular house, which is a regular house. And then those two people, two East Germans come in and they are they're fascinated and then they just they look at everything they're like oh my gosh look at these colors on the wall and, and we're laughing because we're like why would you you know it's just a regular color but they were fascinated they're like 
how, how did you get this bookshelf? Or how did you get this? You must be, you must have connections. And then his dad was like, no, I just bought it in the store. Well, but the bookshelf like that, you must have waited for years. He's like, nope, I just picked it up. But that's how it was in East Germany. Yeah, right. And, and so they were like, you must, and they, were, they accused me like, I think you're on the party. You're on the political party. You have connections. He's like, no, anybody can buy this. So um, we're sitting down, and then they see a TV. And so they, they obviously spoke German too, but their, their verbiage was a little different. So instead of TV, they would call it a television machine. So us teenagers, we're laughing. His, my friend's mom is like, don't you guys laugh at them. They don't know any better. <laughs> and, and so, so they were fascinated. They were like, you have your own television machine? He's like, yeah. So he gets this big brick out because back then remote controls were this big. And he goes, boom. And, it would, and it, he, they couldn't believe it. They're like, it's color. I know for a fact that you are definitely in a party. There's no way that you should have a color television machine. He's like, nope, I, we have two. I have one in the bedroom too. They were just blown away how rich they were. And to me, they were just normal. But, but so then um, remember like me being super skinny, his mom was always good to me. She always thought that maybe my, my parents didn't feed me right. Mm. She's like, are you feeding a lot of food? And I just ate like my metabolism was crazy. So she, so she would often hook me up with cakes. So she was an excellent baker <laughs> and she baked most amazing cakes. So when I went over there, she was like, hey, you guys want cake? We're like, yes. So my, my, my friend Raina, he was more on the chunky side and, and I was so skinny. So she'd come in with two plates of cake and oh. one of them was like this. And the other one was like <laughs> hanging over the edge. Yeah. And she would give me the big one. Yeah. So my buddy's like, I'm your son. Yeah. And, and she's like, yeah, but look how skinny he is. He, he has to have to give him this. So the food was amazing. So I loved going there because it was always amazing food. So now those East Germans are there and I'm excited. She's like, well, that's going to bring some food out. We're all sitting at a table and the mom brings out a bowl of fruit. We're like, fruit? It's boring because, you know, I wanted cake. Yeah. She made the, again... And, and they were like looking at this fruit. They're like, oh my gosh, look at this oranges. <laughs> you must be in a party. What? And you know, they were freaking out that they could see oranges and, and bananas. They, they, have, they were like, they take the bananas. They're like, I've never seen yellow bananas. They're like, the, the only bananas you can get in East Germany, you have to stand in line for several hours and they're, they're black. How did you get the yellow ones? And she's like, I just bought them in the store. We, we have more. So she breaks off one for the guy and one for the, his wife, and the older, older gentleman, he wants to eat it, right? so he wants to open it up, and his wife just snatches it out of his hand. She's like, we're saving that for the grandkids. Give that in my purse. And then the mom is like, no, no, no. We can buy more. Please have yellow bananas for the first time in your life. And they're like, it tastes so different. And obviously, us teenagers, we're laughing because we're like, we never had bananas before. So they didn't have access to normal food on the east side of... No, they would, you would, they would have to stand in line a lot. And where did this food come from? I'm assuming the government kind of rationed it out or something like that? I, th I think um, probably two reasons. So I, I remember we always had food drives. So in West Germany, that would always go in West Germany, West Berlin, and we're like, okay, we're doing a food drive for the people in East Germany. Bring your canned foods and stuff. So everybody brings it back and drops it off, and but sometimes you would bring fruit too, and they would just fill up a whole train cart. But the East Germans were pretty clever, the government, not the people, the government was clever. They wouldn't hand it out. They would sell it to the people. So they would have specific stores and say, you can buy this here, but you can't use your own currency. You can use a, a West German money or US dollars. So if you have some of that, you can buy fresh yellow bananas. Sneaky, right? So they so were trying to collect yeah, the currency. Double, exactly. So they wouldn't... Okay. Exactly. So they have some something in collateral and stuff, yeah. And so that the people wouldn't have access to yes. those currencies. Well, let's let's imagine you would be... Let's say I would be in West... Let's say you you would be in East Germany and we're friends and, and I'm in West... And I come over uh, and, and I know I'm going to be searched while I'm coming in. So I can't bring you any records or any... They would probably confiscate everything, chocolate. They would take it. The border guards would just take all of it. And so you're not allowed to bring that in. Wow. But they wouldn't take my money, right? And I would probably, if we're friends, I would give you, here's, a, here's some money and stuff. So when that comes up, you can go into that store and buy yourself some some good food. And you'd be like, okay, but you would save it, obviously. But, you know, for a special occasion, you would probably 
you know, you'd buy some yellow bananas. So did you ever go no. to East Germany? So I didn't go until the wall, after the wall came down, because you had to pay an entrance fee. And so, and I'm like, you know what, I'm not going to give, and it wasn't, wasn't a lot, it was like 25 bucks a day. So if you would go and visit, you would pay 25, but I'm like, you know what, I'm not giving that East German government my money. That's a lot of money back then, though. Yeah, but even if you, you know, even if you wanted to, I'm like, I'll never go. That was, and my family's like, oh, we don't have to go. Because it was right there. We lived right next to the wall. So like we could have, that would have been a 15 minute car drive, a car ride, and we could probably visit something, but we we're like, I didn't, I didn't want to go. Would you would you be worried about getting back? Well, not so much that. It would just it could take hours. You have so some like, kind of citizenship or something that shows, yeah. hey, we're from West Berlin. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let us back through. Oh yeah, so they had to, you had to show all that. So what you like, if I would, I was in West Berlin and I had to go. If I wanted to go from West Berlin to West Germany, and I would take the car, you go through the border once. Then there were three routes that were allowed to take, so you couldn't just exit somewhere, and then and then you would get back and you had to go through the border again so the the ride would be maybe you might drive through it for two hours two three hours but um you might sit at the border for two or five or eight hours and so most people then like i remember when i would go when i would i played basketball in west germany and i would visit my my parents in west berlin and sometimes i would i would take a ride this is before cell phones like now you could call and say hey i'm still at the border but back then you you couldn't. You'd literally, you pull in, there are very unfriendly border patrol agents, and there would be like, you, line number seven. And you're thinking, oh, that's a long line. That's like 100 cars. Why can't I go to number four? That's like only five cars. Whatever the guy said, that's where you had to go. And you stood in line. And, and you, you could stand there for hours. So what most people would do, and Germans are pretty frugal, and they save money and stuff, what you would do is you put your car in neutral, turn it off and basically because the cars are not that big you just push it so i just stand there and and you just push it so that's what you would do that everybody would stand out there and they just push their cars because you would burn gas for four hours yeah very uncomfortable and it's pounding rain but and i feel like i would have gotten in a lot of trouble there oh yeah well see so those are people just traveling through sometimes you stood you saw people who came back from east germany so if you're somebody who would would go in somebody who would visit relatives from West Germany, they'd go in and then come back out, they would completely take their cars apart. And it's, um, I, I remember, yeah, they would have the dog, the dogs looking for something, they would have the mirrors underneath the car. They probably have it at the Mexican border too. But then those guys would take no. the whole car apart. They don't have a Mexican border. <laughs> well, They don't have a Mexican border. border. The southern border, I mean. <laughs> they don't, it doesn't exist. Well, there, there used to be one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but... I saw people where they literally took the whole car seat out. So, I mean, and you saw people standing there and you saw the guy, that's his car. He's just standing there. He's just like so mad. He's like, <laughs> and he can't say anything. And they would take the whole thing apart and it would take hours. And you're just like, because they were hope they were looking for people. Maybe you smuggled somebody out. There were very creative ways to smuggle people out. I mean, they took the whole thing apart. And, wow. And I was just like, man. Uh, unbelievable so so the third way was would be to come back to, you could either climb over the wall pretty risky you could um, be a pr- political prisoner and you get by, bought out from the west german government or you turn 64 65 and then you were legally allowed to leave those were the ways to to to, to exit wow and then in 89 the wall came down yeah and, yeah. and that was a interesting and it's kind of funny like now sometimes I, me and my f- equally old friends like we were like, yeah, why don't young, young people, why aren't they interested in politics and all that stuff? I wasn't either. Because I was really, my, I was, when that wall came down, I was visiting my dad, my, my, my parents. And my dad would go, he would sit in front of CNN. Now, back then, CNN was a regular news station. And that thing was on 24 hours. And he was just staring at it. He said, there's something happening. And I'm like, Phew. he's like, you don't watch any news? I'm like, I don't really care. And I was, I was in my early 20s. I was stupid. I should have known more yeah but but back then i was like well what could happen my mind and then and then the wall came down and and i won't get into it too much there were some people east germans were allowed to travel into eastern european countries so so it, you could go to hungary and and poland and the soviet union you could vacation there if your boss allowed it you couldn't just go like you'd have to still ask for permission and then once you got it so some people 
think it was in Hungary, over 200 East Germans basically stormed the embassy, the West German embassy. They entered the embassy and said, we're not leaving. And, and so the police and the soldiers couldn't do anything because embassy is, it belongs to another country. So the people who worked at that embassy would go into town by blankets and food and wow. people are staying there, we're not leaving. And that was like a big standoff. Cause, and at some point, East Germany, for whatever reason, and I don't know exactly why, they said, okay, you know what? We're letting, you guys can leave. We, the border's open now, you can leave. So these guys left and then um, the wall just came down. So I, my, my dad woke me up and I was completely clueless. He comes into the room, he's like, hey, wall's coming down. Here's a hammer and a chisel. Get me some pieces with graffiti on it. I'm like, what, Wait, what? <laughs> and, and take your two brothers with you. And there was a three minute walk from our house to the wall. Oh, wow. And Very close. It is possible that I may have had a few drinks the day before, hanging out with my friends. So I'm just like, what? <laughs> And I see the, the whole wall. So they, you weren't supposed to go to the wall. So you could see the wall, but once you touched the wall or once you sprayed something on it, you were actually in East German territory. So in theory, they could get you on it. They wouldn't, but there wasn't exactly between East and West. The wall was set a few feet behind it. And there was a sign here, you're now leaving the American sector. So we, live, we lived in the American sector. So once you go past it, I mean, we would go to the wall, but my dad told me, don't, you, once you go past that sign, you're basically entering something illegally. Don't do it. And now he tells me, here, go and chip a piece of the wall off. And I see all the neighbors standing there. And they're all chiseling. A hundred people. And just wow. chisel, chisel. I'm like, this is mind-blowing. Wow, that's after, awesome. Yeah, after a while, they opened up the wall. And then and my dad, at that time, he was retired, so he would ride his bike a lot. And there was one part he could never go to because there was a wall. So suddenly that wall was gone. Once they took some parts out... People wanted to cross over, but they had some um, deer crossed over and they exploded because they still had mine, mines. So they were like, okay, we need to sweep the area for mines and then it's safe to go. And then after a while, they opened it completely and then you could ride your bike into East Germany. What was the decision or the event that changed that made the wall come down? Why, why did that change? So uh, the official thing they said is, you know... Um, can't sustain it anymore. It's open. We want to be nice. And I'm like, there's no way. And now, after thinking a little bit more about it, I think they knew that, they got, that the country just wasn't sustainable. Like they didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, wasn't doing so great. But if you open it up, maybe that was a way to basically take over. Because the last German chancellor, not the current one, but the one before, was from East Germany. I'm like, what, what if she was briefed and basically ran it, right? It's kind of, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm always thinking certain, um, you're not, I, I think there's a group of people that run a lot of stuff. And that group of people, they might have been like, you know what? Let's open that wall, make people all happy. By the way, you know, you know what, what, what happened? Those East Germans came over in their little cars and they all got gifts from West Germans. Oh wow! And guess what the gift was? What bananas? <laughs> and no joke. So you would you would you would you would walk through through you know you're walking around. You see this old these bad little cars, and behind the windshield wipe, windshield wiper there would be like one or two bananas, and people write down like welcome, and they would give them bananas. I'm like you're feeding them like monkeys, but. Um, yeah, that's what they would do. They were very excited. It was, a, it was an interesting thing. Oh, yeah, that's a beautiful, beautiful thing after living over there for so long. It was, it was crazy, yeah. Now, when they decided to split it up and build the wall, right. they just decided, like, okay, if you live over here, you're yeah. automatically a part of this? Yeah, they didn't care. Wow. They were like, that's the territory. This is where we're building it. And and some people, you know, they're like, you know what, there's a barbed wire. I think I can take my school bus and just slam through it. And they had a wall, and then they built two walls, and then they had people shoot, and and so after a while, they perfected it. They were Jeez. pretty, pretty, pretty clever. Jeez, man, I don't know if we can go back to chiropractic after this. Oh no, but but it's a good one, <laughs> right? If you think about it, I mean, that was a. I, I grew up at that's that, wild because it, it was built 1961, mm -hmm. and 60. I was born 65, mm -hmm. so I always saw the wall, and we had observation towers. It was pretty interesting, so we could go up and we could look over the other side, and and. You could see, like Germany, West Germany, we made 
we made cars, right? So we got the Porsche and the Audi and the Volkswagen and the Mercedes and the BMW, and they were on our side. And then the other side is almost like if somebody said, you know what? We don't like those guys. We're going to do the opposite. But if you build the opposite of a Porsche, it doesn't make it much better. So those cars were horrible. Mm -hmm. They're just gas guzzling, smoke producing. It, it was incredible. Wow. And, and, and so <laughs> that's, that's what that was. And how old were you when you came to the U.S., to, um, when you moved here? When I moved here, I think I was 18 or 19. Okay, I went so, to college, right? Okay, so, so when yeah. you went to college, you stayed right. then, you stayed permanently. No, so, no, no, I went four years to college, and then in 89, I went back and I played professional basketball. And then cutting back to basketball, to, to chiropractic, because that's where, you know, I still had a lot of low back issues. And I, I met a chiropractor before, it didn't really help too much. And, and then at some point, I thought, you know, this, it, it made sense to me. I started reading up on the anatomy books and I was really like, you know, where's this pain coming from? I, I, don't, I didn't even know. You know, I thought it was some, maybe some pain cloud and if you take an aspirin, it goes away because my mind, I didn't know how it worked. And yeah. stuff. So in order to understand that is, and I should have brought a spine model, but I didn't, it's, it, you, you, have a, you have a nervous system which basically consists of, of the brain and then there's a cable hanging down from there called the spinal cord. And that is completely encased in bones. You got a brain, I got a skull around it and then you have the, the, the cable, that, that spinal cord, is encased in not one bone, but 24 movable bones, mm -hmm. vertebra and stuff. And then there's more stuff attached. And then that cable is split up into 31 pairs of spinal nerves, and they go everywhere. So 31 in, pairs. Yeah. So in the neck region, they go all the way down to your hands. Lower back, they go all, all the way down to the feet. And those nerves also con um, uh, split up, and they control all the organs and glands in the front as well. So it's a fantastic system. So your brain controls everything through that system. So it's possible that if you're having some sort of an issue with your organs, right. it could be a spine rooted in it, the spine. It could, yes. Have you, see, have you seen much of that in your yes. time as a chiropractor? Oh, yeah, a lot. Do you, do you have an example or two? That oh, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you have to, first of all, um, the st statistics say that 90%, 80 to 90% of spinal problems you can't feel. So if you can't feel it, you don't know you have it. Yeah. Because right? most people think, well, hey, you're a chiropractor. Well, I wish I could use you, but I'm not hurting, so I'm doing good. And you might do good, but you might actually have a problem you don't even know. So those nerves, when, when, when you, with the model, would have been work. But basically, you have two bones that are sitting on top of each other, and there's a cushion in between mm -hmm. called a disc. So a vertebra, a vertebra, and a disc. And they're sitting on a disc, and they can move a little bit. And each of those bones can move a little bit, and that gives you flexibility altogether. When you bend down... To tie your shoe, it slides backwards, but then when you come back up, it slides back into place. So that's how it's supposed to be. That's why when you're like a little baby and you put your foot behind your head, etc., that's that's how it's supposed to be. But when the foot comes down, it slides back. Everything is everything is perfect, and then those nerve, nerves exit left and right to the spine. Um, those nerves, they don't just like for example the nerves in your lower back. They don't just go all the way into your feet. They also split up every nerve that goes out to the side and goes to a muscle or so it splits up, there's another one controlling an organ. So I've had people who, who would say, man, I messed up my low back, and I need, I need to come in and get it fixed. And I'm like, come on over. And they go, I can't leave the house because I have to stay close to the bathroom. Because that same nerve that causes sciatic pain or just it, can, it also controls your colon. Mm. So then it depends on it goes up higher and higher so you like for example l5 area does go to your to your to, to your colon etc but then l3 would be more for the bladder mm -hmm. so I've, I've adjusted people and they'd be like whoa you know it's funny i adjusted somebody someone's neck and they would say oh, i can move my neck better but i can breathe better i'm like well the same nerves that that caused you the muscles to tighten up are all the same nerves that also control your um, heart and lungs so the, in chiropractic, is not the goal to fix your colon or to fix your stomach or your lungs. It's to remove interference from the nervous system. But since it controls literally everything, it's always, and you, there's a 90% chance that you can't feel it, so it's always a good idea to remove that interference. But the vast majority of people that visit a chiropractor yes. are doing so because their back hurts, their mm -hmm. neck hurts, mm -hmm. and that's, that's pretty much it. I would say... Um, the vast majority of people who start. So like I have patients who, well, I'm doing this for over 20 years now, I have people who see me for more than two decades. Mm -hmm. 
And the logical mind would say, well, why would you go see this guy? Is he, is he ever going to fix it? And, and, and they would say, well, I haven't heard in a long time, but my digestion is really good. And my immune system works much better. Yeah, I go once a month. So I have people who just, they just stay just for maintenance. They come once a month or every two weeks or so. Depends on what kind of job they have. And I'll. And how in, how in depth can you go once a month on a person from the exterior? I mean, because you can, you can put your hands on somebody. You can mm -hmm. put them into different shapes right. and tell basically the location of their skeleton and their muscles. Right. But, but. Well, there's different techniques. So like, I can tell you what my technique does. Okay. So in the guns, so I, um, let me, let me tell you how I got into it. So I'm, so I started school. I didn't know anything that there's 200 techniques. I just, all I knew is that chiropractic helped me get a little bit better. And I wanted to help other people the same thing. I was like, that's going to be cool. I want to be able to help people with low back pain. That was my goal. And then you start school and you realize the nervous system does way more than just, you know, it, 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 yeah, it does way more. Yeah. And I was like, wow, we can help people with other stuff. That's kind of cool too. And then you realize that a lot of people have problems. They don't even know about it. So there were different techniques and I, they've told us there are 200 and I'm the kind of guy, I'm, I'm going to pick the best, right? I mean, why would I pick the fifth best if there's four better, four, you know, but they, they said, well, they're all the same. And I'm thinking, you know, there's no way that 200 things are the same because it makes no sense. Why would you have 200 if they're all the same? I want to just pick one. Yeah. Right. So I, I was kind of like, this is frustrating. I was really frustrated. And then I noticed something. So the instructors in my school, so any instructor in my school who had a, like a light headache or might have a stiff neck, a little sore here, another in, it, um, instructor would adjust them. And we could watch as students. It was fascinating. And do all kinds of stuff, R wrenching on the head, pulling on it, doing all, all kinds of stuff. And we're like, wow, that's, that's legit. I mean, look at that. That's, I guess that's how you have to do it. That's amazing. We didn't, at that time, we didn't learn anything yet. We were just going through anatomy and all those things. And then I noticed when, when, when any of the instructors had, had a real, like I'm talking about, I call it like a real problem, something big, not just a headache, a migraine headache, like a migraine headache with vomiting, that's horrible. Mm -hmm. Or someone who's like, uh, instead of, I'm a little sore here. Now we're talking about somebody who's like, I, I can't sleep, I can't walk, I'm laying on the floor and I have a hard time crawling to the bathroom, I'm in so much pain. When an instructor had that, they would not get adjusted at school. And by the way, I'm not, I'm not talking one technique up over the other. I believe my technique is the best, but there's a lot of other, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to pick you up. Can, you can still be helped or healed or worked right, yeah. on by and other stuff. techniques. No oh, yeah, yeah, right. But, but this one, so I was thinking, well, but when the instructors had something real, they would all go to somebody who did Gonstead chiropractic. And to be honest, I never heard of Gonstead. 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 Sounds like a disease, right? That Gonstead. No way. So, so my first thought is like, what is this? So I go to the library because I'm like, I need to know. I'm like, this is, might be the one thing of thinking that I wanted to do. So I go to the library and I find out and I read up on this, this guy, Dr. Gonstead. Uh, born 1898, died 1978. Uh, this guy was a madman. The guy would see up to 200 patients in a day. In a day. Hmm. I can tell you now when I have a busy week, 200 is very unpleasant for me. <laughs> my wife says I complain a lot if I have to see 200 patients in a the, in the week. I'm like, I'm tired. I want to go home. This guy would do it in a day. He works 16 hours a day. I'm thinking 16 hours. That's a, imagine that's like two full-time jobs in a row. And that's not that easy on your body. And he would work six and a half days a week. Like I work three and a half days a week. Mm -hmm. This guy would do six and a half days a week. Wow. Kept that up for 54 years. I was blown away. I'm like, who does this? This is somebody who's not doing it for the money because he had all the money. And then at age 65, he took his whole life savings and he built the largest privately owned chiropractic clinic in the world. At age 65. At age 65, if I'm still around, I would love to slow down, have a smaller office next to me and see my favorite patients, right? That would be awesome. Yeah. And this guy's like, nope, I'll built this mega clinic, a gigantic one, and then I built a motel, excuse me, a motel with a restaurant for my wife, because people will come from all over the world and I want to see all of them. I'm like, who does this? This is uh, impressive. This guy isn't the, the inventor. Or the... Well, so, so he's, he, this is his technique, right? So the 
chiropractic got discovered in, in, in 1895. But it's okay. not the guy that discovered no, that's not, it. Yeah, no. Okay. So that that guy, um, have you have you heard that, how that came about? I know, really, I know a little bit about really that about, story. It's, it's, it's pretty cool. He was a magnetic healer or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, right. And then he ran over his dad, mm. or his son ran over. That was him. Late, that was late on. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, so so he wanted to help people. He tried magnets, didn't really work. I think he tried honey and bees and all kinds of stuff. But there was a um, janitor in that building, and his name was Harvey, Harvey Lillard. And as a boy, I think he fell down the stairs. Or some, he did something. He messed up. He messed up, and he lost his <laughs> hearing. Right, so he's From a fall? Yeah. Right. So the, the parents took him to a medical doctor to check the ears, and they were like, well, the ears are fine. He should be able to hear, but he couldn't hear. So he grows up not hearing, and he becomes a janitor in that building where Dee Dee Palmer, the guy who discovers chiropractic. That's right, Palmer. Works right there. So, so he somehow communicates with the guy and, and says, wait, so you fell down, you get this weird hump on your back, and now you can't hear, and I don't know how they communicate it. He said, why don't you come over to my office? Maybe I can fix it. I'm a healer. And I don't know how often he had to ask the guy, probably not the first time that the guy said, sure. And he lays him on the floor, and he's he sees this hump on this guy's back and he just pushes down on it. And at some point it cracks really loud. The guy stands up and he's like, wow, I'm really upright. And he suddenly can hear. And then no book, way. Right, so he's like, wow. And he, 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 he was able to, according to his book, D.D. Palmer wrote a book in 1910, and he was able to hear the um, hoof prints of the horses on the cobblestone outside suddenly, and he could hear a ticking clock. Back then, clocks made sound. Not, not, <laughs> not anymore. Unless they're beeping, but so so the Palmer is like, I think I found a way to cure deafness because that's what I would have thought, right? I'm like, I can cure deaf people. Apparently, he advertises in the newspaper. He's like, deaf people, come on over, lay on my coffee table, I'll crunch you a little bit. Well, he does it to those people, and nobody regain, nobody else regains their hearing, but they noticed other things that they felt better, that they had less pain, and that they're. Um, they were less prone to, uh, um, I don't know, like the, the immune system got boosted. So he realized, you know, I guess if a, if a misalignment in the spine causes you to lose your hearing, then you might be able to fix it by pushing on the back. But if they have a different thing going on, you can still help them. So that's the whole idea. Not everybody who's deaf could be helped by chiropractic. Yeah, I think I've had one or two people who's, who told me after... 20 plus years of practice that they're like, yeah, I think I improved my hearing after that. Hmm. But, you know, it would be an interesting experiment to have like a thousand deaf people and see, you know, it depends on how they get it, I guess. Right, right yeah, because there's different ways that... Right, you're missing you, something on the inside, you're missing your, the, the, the nerve, the cranial nerve for the, for the hearing, then you're pushing on the back will probably not fix it. Yeah, wow. So That I have not heard before, that, that story. So, so he... So, so Gunstead... So, yeah, so, so Didi Palmer, he starts a school. At first, he didn't want to share it. So he calls his pastor friend. He's like, I did something really cool, pushed on someone's back, and something really cool happened. How do we call that? And the guy's like, well, uh, uh, excuse the Greek word for hand, Cairo, I think. And you're practicing chiropractic. He's like, that sounds legit. I'm a chiropractor. <laughs> and that's how it came to be. <laughs> Apparently, or something like that. That's was it Greek? I think it was Greek. But, but um, his pastor friend said, this, this sounds like a really good thing. Let's use, it, like, use that word. Well, so then um, he starts a school and people show up and, and then um, Didi Palmer had a son named BJ Palmer. And that's the guy who ran over later on in that story. He ran him over with a car. I don't know who was on purpose or so. But, um, but, but the more interesting part is, so this guy, Gonstead, as a boy, a young boy, he had juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. And according to his book, he said he couldn't even step over um, a broomstick. It was so, so painful, very inflammatory, everything hurts and stuff. They, they called the medical doctor. He made a house visit. He's like, oh, I don't know. Let's give him some pills. Does it help? Nope, doesn't help. So Gonstead, when he was a boy, Gonstead aunt said, you know, um, there's this new thing. There was this farmer, and his name was Dr. Olson. And Dr. Olson used to be a farmer before, and he was about to lose his daughter. So the medical doctors, they, they said, hey, you know what? Um, she's not going to live much longer, so say goodbye to your young daughter, which would be horrible, right, the idea. And, and he's trying everything, and he finds out this weird chiropractor, and he's like, can you help her? And the guy's like, pushes on her back and fixes her up, so she survives. So he says, I want to be a chiropractor. So Dr. Olson 
visits D.D. Palmer and says, I don't have much money, can I become a, but I want to study this stuff. I'm really on fire for this. And D.D. says, you know, if you come up with a tuition, you can even stay in my house. And, and so he becomes a chiropractor. And so when Gonstead had his juvenile rheumatoid arthritis flare up, Olsen was the guy who visits him. And he's like, well, the boy has a problem. Let's lay him on the couch. I'll push on his back. And I'm staying in your house until he's fixed up. He stayed for two or three days. So hmm. he slept on the couch and he ate with the family. And he's like, okay, well, it's time to lay down. I'll push on your back, see if we can get more movement. And after two or three days, Gonstead was completely well and healed and everything. And the young Gonstead said, I want to do that too. It looks pretty cool. So he actually goes to school when he was a little older. He, had a, he, had a, um, he worked at some mechanical company first. And then he he went to chiropractic school, the Palma Palmer so School. When you're saying pushing you push on their back, mm-hmm. that's are you simplifying what they were doing or is oh, yeah. that basically okay. Yeah. That's a simplification of yeah. what they were doing with but, the spine. Yeah. So basically they are trying to realign the spine, right? Mm-hmm. And I guess back then uh, I'm pretty sure they didn't have x-rays. I know that uh, x-rays got dis- discovered in 1895, same year as chiropractic was discovered. But I'm pretty sure Dr. Olson didn't have an x-ray machine with him when he just did Gonstead. Mm-hmm. He must have felt, went for touch. Yeah, This one sticks out. He probably pushed it forward. And uh, he probably did it a couple of times. Wow. And, and that's how that happened. So so Gonstead, when he came back, he he actually, funny enough, he, he failed in practice. And then, and then Olsen broke both of his feet because a table fell on him. And Olsen said, this will take a year to heal. You, would you do me a favor and take care of my patients? And then he suddenly actually learned how to adjust properly. Gonstead himself graduated in 1923 in a class of 800 people. A lot of women in it too. So I saw the class photo, which is a, a gigantic group. And I'm like, that's weird because back in the day, Women didn't have many jobs, and but there were a lot of women in it. And it's interesting in that um, commencement speech, apparently, they said uh, there's a 50-50 chance for you guys, so half of you will end up going to jail for practicing medicine without a license. I have to be honest, if somebody would have told me, hey, you know what, there's a 50-50 chance of you going to jail for what you're doing, I wouldn't do that job. And those guys were like, well... I take the chance because I want to help people. That's it takes a strong person to go. You know what? And and so you have to believe in. Yeah, it. I mean they're literally, yeah, they believed in it. Like I'm gonna fix up people. So this is what I'm gonna do. So that, it takes it took some really strong individuals back in the day, and they wouldn't be in jail forever. So, so like you know, when you're working on somebody's yeah. back, are you are you addressing fascial tissue at all? So. So in the Gonstead system, what so we use, I should have, I don't know, sorry, I drifted off. There's five things that we look at. So the first thing is we look at how, if you're coming in, are you holding, if you're walking funny, right? Like some people limp, some people turn in a funny way. So you kind of try to figure out what's going on. And obviously you listen to them. And patients might say, I don't know, my, my hip just, I can't move my hip properly. And this hurts and it's radiating into my groin or whatever they tell you. You listen and you're trying to figure out what it is. And then the second thing in, in the Gonstead system is you use a handheld instrument that measures temperature. It has two probes and compares left to right, and you run it down the spine. And if there's any inflammation at any level, there's 24 bones. If there's inflammation, if you go slow enough, the needle will actually swing to that because it's a really sensitive instrument. So you, every patient who comes in, they sit in front of me or I sit behind them actually, and I run the instrument down their back and I, I, I check if there's any temperature difference. And if I find something, I have a little marker, skin marker, and I draw a little line that tells me, come back to this one and see if that's actually stuck. So you look at them first, then you use an instrument to measure temperature, and then you do a, what's called a motion. Well, for people who don't understand with the, what you're doing with the temperature is you're trying to see if there's that's inflammation, because inflammation, right. it'll be warmer. Yes, and generally one side is warmer than the other. So when you run the instrument down, it's usually one side is warmer than the other. It's very rare that, uh, that people have it on both sides. It's usually one side worse than the other. Why do you suppose that is? Um, there's a ligament running down. You mean like if, if somebody's not hurt, if they're healthy and fine? If yeah, you I just still measure. check everything, yeah. So yeah. any patient who comes in, I don't ask them, hey, what do you hurt? Like um, I ask them if there's anything different. I watch them walk. Then they sit down and I run the instrument down their back. And I want to see if there's any temperature difference. 
if there's no temperature difference at all, I would double and triple check. But once I realized there's nothing wrong, I would send them home. I'd say there's nothing I can do today. And I've done it before. So that's a that's a really huge marker for yes. what you're going to do next. Right. And those are the first two, right? So then the third one, three and four, are mo- um, they're called um, palpation. Are you looking for edema? When something is inflamed, usually there's extra fluid in that joint. And often the fluid comes from the skin. So when you run the finger down, you almost feel like a little dip. And you realize, hey, there's something here. And it usually coincides with something. You can see the spine is bent to that side. And in addition, there's also a temperature difference at that level. And then you check and you push into the segments and you realize, okay, they're all supposed to move a little bit. But that segment doesn't move right. It's stuck. So now I know there's a problem. And then if I have an x-ray on on them, so all the adults have x-rays on, but on pregnant women, I don't have any. On kids, I don't have any x-rays. And, but generally, the fifth part would be comparing it to an X-ray. So you, 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 you have an X-ray of this patient, and you don't take one every time, right? You take one once, and then so now that gives me a blueprint that shows me, it, first of all, is it safe to adjust? Can we push on that? Because there are some conditions where you don't want to adjust it. It'd be a really good idea to know that. And then it also shows you how, you know, because like it shows you how is it misaligned? Is it t- twisted to the left, to the right? Is it risen up on one side or the other? Because you want to undo that misalignment just like the x-ray shows you. Hmm. And once you have all that, you, you put it all together and then you adjust it. And you have to be on the right bone. So this is none of, I used to go to a nice car practice and the way I got adjusted, and I'm, I'm not, like I said, I'm not judging it, but the way they adjusted me, I'd lay on my back, somebody grabbed my head, twisted left and right, they flipped me over, punch, 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 lift, twist, twisty, twisty here, and I was done. That's and, what I've seen. That's, right, yeah. that's all that's I've ever of, seen. A lot of them do it, and I'm sure they help a lot of people. And I'm, but in the Gonset system, that's not how you do it. Right? In the Gonset system, you examine the whole spine, and it's possible that you only find one thing or two things. So it's the, it's basically like the next level. Instead of just going, well, uh, this one feels like it's sticking out. Like, I want to know which one it is, and then what kind of symptom do they have? So I'll give you an example. I'm like this level here in the back would be um, like a level of T5, T6, that's between the shoulder blades. And that's the area that goes to your upper GI tract, so stomach. So as a possibility, if somebody has a problem at that level, due to maybe a fall or hunching over or doing whatever, that the nervous system cannot properly control the stomach. The information from the stomach up to the brain back and forth is interrupted. I'm not saying it's cut. It's a little bit interrupted. It doesn't work right. And so like false hunger signals or no, something? No, you, no, more like, oh, I get heartburn after I eat. So you, like, like let's, let's, let's take, let's imagine it's a person and they're, everything is perfect. They eat a hamburger and they go, you don't have to worry. You don't have to think about it, just food goes in and etc. Mm. But then one day they they fall asleep on a bad couch. They're misaligned something or they fall. And maybe by chance that their T5 is misaligned, that's at that level. Mm-hmm. And the nerve from the stomach to the brain is a little bit, it's not pinched off, but it's irritated a little bit. So the brain normally relies on the information from the nerves all the way up to the brain saying, hey, you know what, he just ate a burger. And then your brain, in simple terms, calculates and says, okay, well, we need this much hydrochloric acid, and we need this amount of um, stomach enzymes to digest this, this burger. And then the information goes down, the cells in the stomach make that particular stuff, and, and you don't even have to worry about it. But now something happens, right? So something is misaligned, the T6, T5, T6 is misaligned, and um, you're eating a burger, and like a few minutes later, you're holding your stomach, and you're like, oof, I'm hurting. And your friends go, I know what, oops, your friends say, I know what that is. That's heartburn, or GERD, or acid reflux, all the same. And I know what that is. You don't make enough um, hydrochloric acid. Oh, no, you make too much. And then they give you a pill, like a Rolaids or one of those purple pills. Yeah. And you're like, oh, that feels much better, right? And, and, and your, mind, your mind says, well, so I guess I'm having stomach pain because I don't have enough Rolaids or, wait a minute, I don't know. But you don't really care. And when you, normally when you go to a medical professional, that's what they do, right? They go, you have heartburn? Well, I got some for you. Let's try this. And stuff. So in chiropractic, you think in a different way. Well, is it possibly due to a misalignment in the spine? And then if it is, and you adjust it, and now the nerve is free, so now the stomach can heal. So now you actually, you can fix the, the stomach. With wow. That. And wow. That's, and that's, that's fascinating. 
so um, I'll give you an example. So I have a lady who works for me, and, and she had heartburn. And, you know, I adjust her, and she gets better. But it doesn't go all the way. It doesn't go away completely, and it drove me crazy. I can't have a front desk girl hurting. How, how is she going to tell people, hey, this guy can help you, and then I can't help. So it, it drove me crazy. I was just yeah, like, I bet. how is this possible? Yeah. So a question I had before I forget it is, yes. if you have, um, do you, have you ever found somebody who doesn't have a temperature difference on the spine, but still has an issue? Oh, yes. But let, let, me, let me give you the last one, because it's really cool. So I was frustrated. I wanted to help her. I know I was adjusting her well, and she would always get better, but not 100%. It drove me crazy. So I'm studying, I'm looking at the anatomy notes and, and Gonstadt's notes, and Gonstadt found that there's not just a nerve from here that goes to your stomach. There is another nerve. It's called the um, a vagus nerve. It's a cranial nerve that exits the head, and, you know, vagus nerve, we, people have heard that. Yeah. And the vagus nerve can be compromised by a top bone on the spine that's misaligned. So the top bone, C1, atlas, can, can misalign. And if it misaligns in a, just in the proper way, and it rotates in a certain way, and if it's on the left side, it rotates to the front, oops, and if it rotates on the right side, it rotates back on that, it can put pressure against the vagus nerve, and that can cause your stomach to cause problems. So once I figure that out, obviously double and triple checking that area and and she had a misalignment there so after adjusting that that completely fixed it wow that was like a, the next level chiropractic not just like crunching something the next level is like well which one goes to the stomach t5 t6 that's probably a problem but realizing there's other things that create some that could cause a problem and in that case it was the vagus nerve so that was it yeah and then you you asked a different question sorry i, I shouldn't have. no you're good and, and the question was is it possible to have no temperature difference? Sometimes... And still have an issue. Yeah. So sometimes there's so much inflammation that the instrument won't... Everything is inflamed. Oh, so, then so the they'll, they'll match, yeah, but so, they're higher than they should be. Yes, right. So, well, but the needle goes to... It still stays kind of in the middle. It doesn't give you a good reading. So in the Gonstead system, either you can tilt the, spine, the scope. It's called a scope. You can use it sideways. But sometimes you... Well, you know what? The x-ray shows me that L5 is really posterior, meaning it slipped back a lot. The symptoms tell me, you know, the leg, the pain goes down the leg in the back. So that is a pretty good indicator that it's, it's probably L5. And then you check and you realize that's not moving. So even though the instrument may have not given you conclusive evidence which one is the problem, you still adjust it. Yeah, you're hunching over to one way and so you can still do it. So we have five tools, but sometimes... Like on a pregnant woman, I usually don't have an x-ray unless they have my, been my patients before and I have an older x-ray of them. But then I only have four tools and those four tools just st still works. Mm -hmm. I can still do it. Ideally, it's obviously to have all five. Wow. So, sometimes you have someone who's like, oh, I want x-rays. I'm like, that's like telling me, touch me with oven mitts. <laughs> it makes it much harder. Yeah. And I, you don't. You don't. You don't want me to use the best tool that that's available to find find the problem, and often people just don't know. You know, you just have to explain it to them. So instead of having somebody come in with back pain and you just twist and crunch them and stuff, you look for the root of it, the source, yes. the cause, uh -huh. and then you address that. Yes. Do you crunch other things? So, so in addition, well, anything, only stuff that I find. Okay, that's so, my question. So if I, if I let's say if you came in and you were like. You know, I'm actually, I just liked you so much, but I have no problem at all. But um, you hunch over a lot when you're working on engines, maybe. Yeah, it's possibly a low back problem and stuff. So I would, I would check the whole thing. So the first thing is I would take your history and then I would examine you. And if I find something, let's say at L5, but you might also have something, let's say at C7, uh, I would mark that. And then, and then after, and I would check, are these segments moving or not? And they usually coincide with something. So if I find something, I would I would tell you, you know what? That area that where you have a problem at, that's the reason why these two fingers sometimes have a problem. And you say, yeah, it's those two fingers. They fall asleep sometimes at night. And when you're older, you have it even more. And and then you realize what's well, coming from there. And then you would want to want to address it. So I would address everything that I find. Unless there's a certain so this guy Gonstad was pretty clever. 
So I follow his whole thing. I try to follow it 100%. There are certain instances where you, where you don't want to adjust everything, but you that somebody comes in and they have a they have a specific problem. You so even though I say you, know, you have a brain, spinal cord, and the nerves, there's a sympathetic and a parasympathetic nervous system, right? So parasympathetic is this area from here up, from oops, your uh, from, from like, your chest or your yeah up here, right? And then from the the lower back and the hips and stuff, that's parasympathetic. And then the sympathetic is in between here. And and Gonstad figured you get better results if you don't so, mix that. So for people that can't see what you're doing, right. oh, so the the sympathetic is where? So sympathetic would be like the whole neck. Okay. To simplify it. So the whole neck, all the vertebrae in the, in the neck, and then from lower back all the way down to the hips, etc. So anything in between would be sympathetic. Okay. And parasympathetic is the, is the neck and the hips and below okay so and generally you can adjust everything but sometimes when you when you want to um, address certain issues you may want to stay in one particular area so um it's just it's better right you also don't want to adjust 20 things the less you adjust the better because your body has more time to to heal yeah so in that in that sense have you ever been worried about like breaking someone's neck when you're doing an adjustment so in the gunset system you never twist the neck Right, so like oh. like you don't twist it and stuff like never so what you do is once you find up let's say you find c7 or so those bones when you they misalign backwards so you have to shove them forward you push them forward but you can't push it forward by twisting there is not possible for you to try it out like you, you can't push a shopping cart forward by twisting it right <laughs> it'll make a lot of noise and it'll bang left and right but you have to go right behind it and you basically have to adjust it properly Okay. So, but anybody who's older than me, I always think, well, you know, they might have, I always assume that they have severe osteoporosis. Better safe than sorry. Right? Do, you, do you have to factor in muscular tension when you're adjusting somebody? You do. Like if they're, if they're tense and yes. tight, do you do something different or like have them breathe to relax before you make an adjustment? Um, I, t I try to catch them off guard. Okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> then um, how does, um, how familiar are you with yoga? I'm, I've done a few sessions. I'm not good at it. Okay. I was told it's not a, com a competition, but... Um, yeah. No, it's for spinal health. So I like I like the stretching part of it. So I, I really like it. So that's a really cool one. And for, for a while, my wife and I kind of did that. I'm not a big fan of the philosophy, but if you use the stretching, I, that part I really like. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. That it's the combining of the, the shape plus the breath. To, yes. to address the spinal health and then, of course, the rest of the skeleton branching out from that. Oh, yeah. So I've I've found that. I, I used to do a lot of yoga, and I found that to be really helpful for spinal and skeletal health. And then your oh, yeah. your musculature just kind of follows along I, after you align the spine. Whenever I see, like, older folks, and when I say older, it's like my age and older, and um, when I see them being in really good shape, generally they have some kind of a yoga or at least a stretching program. And I have to admit, I, I wasn't really big on stretching, but it's a good thing to do, and I should probably start incorporating it for myself. I show a few stretches to my patients, but it probably would be worth it to look at more, you know. Yeah, I hear, I hear Tai Chi is another one they do too. Oh, yeah, and that's good for the brain too, by the way. That's a Really? Interesting, yeah. That's, um, I am um, for a while, and this is a long time ago, um, I had a Tai Chi instructor, and, and he said, hey, I want to, Let's do a little class together. I'm like, okay, I can't hurt to do this because there's a lot of balance stuff. And 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 basically, apparently that's really good for your brain because you have to memorize certain things. You'd that's be like, why. You'd be like, sort in, sort out, rain, whatever. He had all these different words. And so and we, we learned like seven or eight different things. And he would be like, okay, now we're going over from sweeping here to do this and this. Pretty impressive. You stand on one leg, you do this. And then I got to um, have a Chinese lady who grew up in China. And I told her about it. And she's like, well, I memorized 200 different moves. So my my stuff is extensive, but she's done it all her life. And it's a pretty impressive thing to come up with certain stuff. I mean, it's impressive. So they say it's really good for balance and, and, and strength and core strength, but also good for the brain. So that's a good thing. So you learn a move or a hundred moves, and then you can kind of string them together into a flow yes, or a right. session. Yeah, exactly. I see. Much yeah, like yoga. Cool. Yeah, it's pretty okay. cool. Right on. I don't do that, but it's, I should do it. So it would be a good thing to do. Yeah. Well, um, so one thing that I've, I've heard before is that chiropractors are not real doctors. <laughs> 
what do, how long do you have to go to school for being a chiropractor and what is what's the deal with all that so, so when you when you when you start so i i, I graduated 89 because you're a physician well right? no no just, so i graduated with a bachelor of science degree so once you have a bachelor of science degree you're allowed to keep going so i i you know i did four years of undergraduate uh, marketing degree and then i decided i want to do chiropractic now if i would have known earlier all my electives could have been anatomy and physio anatomy physiology chemistry physics etc but i didn't know so i just got a regular degree and so later on i had to go for two more years of um, pre-med so now I, I did that i doubled up so i did it in one year but this basically it was a two-year program mm -hmm. and we i sat in classroom with future uh, pharmacists, medical doctors, nurses, chiropractors, DOs, everything. So they were all, they all had to take the same classes, and the classes were I had to take anatomy and physiology one and two, chemistry one and two, organic chemistry one and two, yuck, and, <laughs> and physics one and two. Some of them was interesting. Some stuff like, well, we oh. really need to do this and stuff. Yeah. And then once you have that, then you can start chiropractic school. So chiropractic school is four years, just like a medical doctor. Four years for chiropractic uh -huh. school. Yeah. So basically, like any chiropractor that you feel who, who graduated in this country, they will have four years of, of undergraduate. Um, they have one or two years of pre-med, and then they have another four years of chiropractic school. So it's... Um, you said just like a doctor? Yeah. Oh, yeah so yeah, a doctor right. is four years after those prerequisites? Yeah. Oh, right. I didn't know that. No, so like a medical doctors, obviously, then they have like a residence program and stuff where they cut people open. So in, in chiropractic, you basically, you're done after those four years. Right? But all, to, all together, like I went to college for in nine, for nine years because I doubled up. If I would have done, if I would have known, if my goal would have been, you know, hey, I want to be a chiropractor. And when I, I would have taken like biology as an undergraduate thing and then I would have would have been able to skip the pre-med and I could have gone directly I could have probably done it in eight years mm -hmm. but I didn't so I had to do pre-meds and I doubled up so I got it in nine years right on. and then you graduate as a doctor of chiropractic and that's 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 what you are and you can see patients and okay you know, when, when you compared and it's um I don't know I'm, I'm probably wrong but if you compared I know you know the, all the classes that we have they're pretty pretty impressive like all the class most of the classes are taught by medical doctors so we had we had cardiology in school taught by a cardiologist mm -hmm. but when you're taking it obviously i know that i'm not going to do anything to your heart right so all i'm like okay I'm, you're learning it but basically i learned enough to realize hey, that might be a problem i should maybe send you to a cardiologist yeah and that's how you would do it right and with and the way that you operate a little bit more in depth, it seems like it would be really helpful to have that extra knowledge of what oh yeah. what the different parts of the body do and how they work together right. or relate to each other. The, the trick, though, is also when when you when you think about it, your if somebody has a has a heart problem, right? Generally, they don't come to see me. They don't say, "Oh, you know, can you fix that heart?" So I, I give you I give you a good story. I have a good story about that too. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> but but um. Generally, they don't do it like that, right? They come in and I, I adjust them, but I'm going to say, I did have a friend come over from Germany. So so I, when I played professional basketball, when we played, and nobody had an, you don't have an agent, right? You just meet with a the team and they say, this is how much we're going to pay you. And you're like, I want more. And they're like, well, we can't give you more, but we give you a car. <laughs> okay, cool. All right, you can have a car too. And then, uh, well, we give you an apartment. Okay, cool. And then, then you know, that you, you can negotiate yourself. So I had this guy in, in, my, in my team, and he was like my big brother, right? And, and he would always look out for me. He's like, oh, ask for this. And they can't give you more money, but ask for a cool car and do this. So, so we, basically, I, I was in debt to him. And I could never repay it. And a couple of years ago, he contacts me. He's like, hey, I'm, I'm going to come and visit. I want to bring my two daughters. And we're old men. Like, he's like, I don't know, old. I was like in my mid 50s and he was late 50s and he had two daughters at 19 and 20 and he's like can we stay in your house for and i'm like yes i mean finally i can repay you for all this nice thing and stuff and he doesn't like chiropractic so he's a medical doctor oh that's he's hilarious. a surgeon for 25 years so mm -hmm. this guy is a top medical doctor and i'm like how come we don't like and he likes me but and he trusts me but he's like i don't like chiropractic i'm like why not he's like i don't know i saw that tick tock wrench the hat i'm like well i would never do that 
He's like, I saw that neck twisting. I don't like it. I would never twist your head. He's like, well, and so the, the two girls that I had, both of them had, um, they had issues. And I think one of them had, one of them had a permanent headache all day. Got used to it, but I always have a headache. And then both of them had low back issues. And they're young, 19 and 20. You shouldn't have any of that. And they were in good shape, so there was no... And I said, I think... Uh, he's like, well, can you, as my, can you do me a favor and see if you can help him? I'm like, let's go. And so I take the x-ray and I adjust them. And, and that's not a huge thing because they're so young. Right? They didn't... I mean, even though they had problems, but I, I, I was confident that something would get better. So immediately they go to their dad and they're like, hey, I think my headache is gone. My low back feels better. He's like, are you kidding? He's amazing. He's like, I want to be a patient too. I'm like, finally. <laughs> I wanted to repay him for all the good he's done over the years. Yeah. So I take the x-ray, I analyze everything. And, and you know, he knew stuff. I, this is spinal, I mean, he's an orthopedic surgeon, but he worked on spine. So he, know, he knew all that stuff. We're looking at the x-ray and he found my approach interesting because they're looking for bigger things, like something is broken or something. I'm like, look at this. It's just slightly misaligned. He's like, can that cause a problem? I'm like, well, definitely. And then, so I examined him and then I won't say his name because I, I, but I said, I found something on him and, and that, that area controlled his prostate. Mm -hmm. So when I adjusted him, I adjusted him a few times. I adjusted him. He, he stayed in my house. So we only had two weeks. So I adjusted him every day because I wanted to make the most out of it. Yep. And I adjusted him at home and he's like, you know, the first time he's like, I feel a little looser. I'm like, this is not a massage. This is, I'm restoring a nervous <laughs> system. He's like, okay, well, let's see. And then, and then after a few visits or so, after a few, he's like, I don't have to go to the bathroom every 30 minutes. I'm like, well, because L5 also controls your prostate and that's why it was. And he's like, are you kidding me? That makes total sense. Because yeah. he obviously, he Being knows the doctor, anatomy, yeah. right? And he's like, are you kidding? That's crazy. So he says this to me. He says, you know, I have one problem. I have it for over 20 years. And, and he says, I, I have atrial AFib, atrial fibrillation. Can you help that? What is, what is that? Well, so it's a, so I was thinking, well, what was, I was thinking, well, what is that? Like I knew it was something with the heart. Mm -hmm. And, and so I, and he tells me his symptoms and stuff. And I know I've had patients who told me oh, I have AFib. And I was just writing it down. I think they're not coming in for this. You know, if you say, you know, but so I'm writing it down, but nobody ever came in for that. So he says, do you think this constant stuff can help? I said, I don't know. I've, I mean, the nerves control the heart, maybe. So I look up in Gonstead's notes, and Gonstead said, if the top bone in the spine is misaligned and it rotates and it puts pressure against the vagus nerve again, that can also cause atrial fibrillation. And I read, I read this this thing to to him. He says the anatomy is spot on. So um, he says, you know, I'm gonna try. And so I check his, the top part in the spine. I check everything, and I realize there's actually a misalignment. Now he's kind of freaked out. He's like, what are you gonna do to me? What are you gonna do? I'm like, just let me lightly adjust it. And I push it over a little bit. And and he he's like, oh, I think I feel better, but we don't know, right? It's just, that's the thing when you asked, well, is it possible it worked? He's like, well, I feel better. I guess it worked, but we didn't really know. That was no, no tool. So he feels better. His low back feels better. His prostate works better. He's happy. He goes back to Germany and then he calls me. He says, I'm on my way to the hospital. I'm having a heart attack. I'm like, whoa. And um, he had, he, by the way, he had a surgery for, for the, um, they tried to burn his nodes to, to get rid of the atrial fibrillation. Oops. But it didn't work. So he's on the way. He calls me. He's like, I'm on the, on the way. I'm having a, I'm, ha I'm having a, I think I'm having a heart attack. I'm like, oh my gosh. Yeah. He's like, yeah, just pray for me. I'm like, okay, no problem. He calls me a little later. He's like, you know, what's funny. Um, I had an EKG and this, for the first time in 20 years, my EKG was normal. It felt, this, this normal felt so abnormal that I totally, I think the spine got fi fixed that. Wow. So he calls his friend, the cardiologist who did the surgery. And funny enough, instead of like here, sometimes they go, chiropractor, nah, that, that, that can't help. I don't know. And, and this guy was just happy for him. He's like, how did it ha happen? And, and, and my buddy told him, he's like, hey, the top on the spine put pressure against the vagus nerve. And the guy's like, the anatomy is... That's crazy. Makes sense. So now I'm not saying that everybody who, who has AFib could be fixed up with chiropractic. Because mm -hmm. uh, you can have other issues, right? But it's, it's kind of like, it's, think, think of it in a different way. Imagine you come home, it's dark out, and you want to turn the light on, and, and it doesn't work. Like you know, The first thing, you wouldn't 
put a new light bulb in, you wouldn't buy a new lamp. The first thing is you would make sure it's plugged in, right? If it's a freestanding lamp, mm -hmm. that's the first thing you do. And then it, once you realize it's not, maybe a dog pulled, a, pulled on the cable. Once you have that cable in your hand and you know it's not plugged in, you know it can't work, you don't know if it will work once you plug it in. Right. I mean, it could be. It worked yesterday, but you don't know for sure. So you're hoping you plug it in. Could be the bulb. It could be other things too, but you definitely know it needs to be plugged in. That's the minimum. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do with, with somebody when I examine somebody and they say, so you think you can help with my can help my stomach with my heartburn and I'm like you know what you have a problem in that area that controls the stomach so it's totally possible but I can't guarantee it it is possible that you have another issue let me remove interference to the from the nervous system so your body can work better and and then we'll see so you never know so when somebody comes in and say hey can you fix my headaches well in the medical field I think there's a the list goes up to 3,000 known causes for headaches which is crazy, right? Too much sleep, too little sleep. Too much uh, sleep. Huh? Yeah, and apparently that, that's on the list too. Oh, Certain chemicals, then you bumped your head. I mean, there's a list of 3,000 things. Just reading it would probably give you a headache, right? So just, <laughs> right? So when somebody comes to us, can you help me with headaches? I'm like, well, what I'm looking for is, is there misalignment in the spine? And if there is, and it doesn't put pressure on the nerve, and if there is, removing it, I can guarantee you, will be of benefit. But you can't guarantee that headaches go away. Because I've had patients who had other things. I had some patients who had brain tumors and stuff. and But if they have an additional problem, correcting it is still better. I mean, it won't fix the problem. But I've had people who say, you know what? I know I have this issue here with my brain, but at least I can turn my head better and I feel better. And I'm like, I wish I could fix it completely. So if you have somebody whose spine is out of alignment, you, mm -hmm. you have to adjust them. A lot yes. of times it'll be like somebody has lower back pain. Right. They go get adjusted and right. then they have to go back again. Well, it depends, right? It depends what they have, right? So it depends how long you have it. I, I, um, you take a guy who's a, let's say you take a construction guy with low back pain because it's pretty common, right? I you can adjust them. They come in, they can hardly walk. You adjust them, maybe you adjust them a few times. And they might say, well, I feel better, but guess what? They're going to go back to their work. They have to. Yeah. So that's, that's you know. So that's, you're, you're engaging again in this, the yeah. cycles of movement that created the pain initially. Yes. So it's, so it's, it's not mess it up like again. a permanent healing necessarily. Well, not even, even, even if you go to the dentist. Right? Yeah. The guy's right. going to be like, hey, you're going to have to keep flossing. Yeah. And you're going to be like, <laughs> yeah. but I feel really good now. I'm like, it doesn't matter. Right. You have to do it. I mean, you're going you're gonna to mess it up with eating. Some people eat three times a day or more. You should probably brush them three times a day. So is there any kind of a practice or a, a preventive maintenance yes. thing that you recommend right. for people? So obviously creating a strong core. Okay. Right? So like somebody who does yoga, many of them got strong cores so and mm -hmm. that'd be of benefit. <clears throat> Sitting on a couch that has no support, that's not good. So movement, like most people don't move too much, including me. I mean, like uh, my office is in Phoenix. It's hot. I, uh, you want to wake up at four in the morning to go walk. Most people don't. So, and we drive to work, you know, and then, I mean, like I'm actually working standing up, but most people that sit at work. Mm -hmm. So you sit somewhere, you sit on something that doesn't have really good low back support. And then you drive back home. That's what most people do. Five days a week and then on the weekend, they're so exhausted. You're covering. Uh, yeah. <laughs> or they, they do something they shouldn't and they get injured. Oh, I play, I'm in 50 and I'm, I played a little football. I think I got injured. I'm like, well, you weren't in the shape to do it. So, <laughs> so it's, it's easy to get injured. There's four ways how people can get, get, get spinal problems. The first one would be a big trauma. Look, big trauma would be you fall off a ladder or you... You know, you have a car, car accident, accident, right? Yeah. yeah, that would be big trauma. You know, it happened. You're like, this, this happened. The second one would be small trauma repeatedly. That would be someone hunching over in the car and just doing the same movement. That's the lady who cuts, you know, types all day. The lady who cuts hair, right? And she's doing this movement for eight hours a day. It accumulates small trauma that accumulates. And after two years, you know, oh, my neck is hurting. That'd be small trauma. Chemicals can do it too. And then even stress too, right? You got somebody nonstop yelling at you. You're probably walking around like this. And then you're wondering why you get a headache at the end of the day. So mm. those four things and all a combination of four can cause problems. Is caffeine one of those chemicals? To be honest, I don't know. I mean, I, I know when you when I don't drink any coffee, at some point I get a headache. So, so but, 
But I don't know if there's a misalignment. I actually don't know. It'd mm. be an interesting test. I know with coffee, what it's doing, it's it's releasing um, the stress hormones. Right. And I know that those can obviously make you more stressed out. Right. So then you're, you're holding tension or you're more likely to hold tension depending on what you're doing. Like if you drink coffee and then right. you're going to be engaged in something that that the coffee actually helps with, that's one thing. Right. But if you're going to go drink coffee and then you sit and do computer work after that, and I mean, your body's that, right? probably, yeah, yeah every, all kinds of people. I've had some interesting cases actually, because you asked for, well, because I mean, logical, right? You got a misalignment in your lower back, so yeah. that could cause low back pain. It could even go down to the foot, so they call it sciatica. Same thing in the neck, right? That makes sense, because we know the nerves go from here to here, so it makes sense. But um, it's interesting when you look at certain like like organs or glands. So I've had some people who um, uh, was a, a gentleman and his wife had a lot of panic attacks, right? And I was thinking, what well, panic attacks? Well, my first thought is, well, how could I help that, right? I mean, she went to the medical facility and they couldn't help her. And but I know Gons that used to say, if if your um, your adrenal glands. Those are the ones that sit on top of your kidneys. That's like a region around T10, 11, 12. That's that kind of area in the back. If there's a problem there, those don't work right. So the adrenal glands and every other organ or gland in the body needs the right nerve supply. So if you have a problem there, it may be off. And then they may fire too much or too little, and then it's off. And something doesn't work right. So it turned out that she had um, a, a panic attacks through that. And I was able to find it because it was... It was, I was like, oh, that's why right I touched it. It was really painful. I adjusted it, and then it just panic attacks just disappeared. And she had quite a few, and those were permanently gone. Wow, that right. is awesome. That was actually my next question. Oh, really? It was, I was going to ask you about um, more like emotional or cognitive issues. Can right. people, can a misalignment of the spine give you cognitive issues? Yes. And or emotional issues such as depression or anxiety? So to be honest, I don't know how, right? I know you can, I, I've, I've read some of the literature, there was there's a few different things, but I can tell you this, I've had people who you adjust them and they suddenly, they go, wow, oh, I start crying and you're thinking, was I too rough? And they go, no, 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 it wasn't too rough, but I, I don't know, I just feel so free, I feel so good. I'm like, well, that's, mm-hmm. my first thought is like, oh, I'm really happy and give me a good testimonial because it's a unique thing, right? Because it's a, yeah. I think not not everyone, but I've I've had people who were like, oh yeah, so yeah, you can you can have that. So I guess a misalignment in the spine can cause all kinds of weird stuff. I give you, I sh- let me tell you one of the best ones, and this I'm, I like to I like jokes, and I like to make fun of myself. So this is a this is probably twenty years ago, and I got this older gentleman, and and he comes in, and he comes in for headaches and numb feet. A lot of people have that, so I examine him, and I find something in the neck find something in the lower back, which makes sense because it goes to the feet. You know, I'm like, that makes total sense. But I find something at, I think it was T12. And and as I look at him from the front, so like the ladies wear a gown when I examine them, but the gentlemen often they just take a shirt off, right? Mm-hmm. So I, And I see this hose hanging out of his neck. And I'm like, what's with the hose? He's like, uh, unfortunately, he was 79 years old. He's like, I have end-stage renal, renal failure. So my mind says, end stage, that's not good. Renal, that's kidneys. Oh, that's not a good thing. He's like, well, I didn't come in for that. So I want you to help me with my low back and my numb feet. But when I examined him, I found the area that controls the kidneys. And I'm thinking to myself, could I help this guy? Well, I didn't dare to say anything because I thought, you know, I don't know. What if the guy says, hey, you still didn't fix it? So plus, that's not really... So I, he comes in, I adjust him, and he's like, you know, my headaches are getting better. And then after a while, he says, you know, I think the numbness of my feet goes away. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. Anything else? He's like, no. I'm like, anything else? You gotta, you gotta have something else better. He's like, well. So he had, he had to go three times a week to dialysis for a few hours each. He oh, said, you know, man. it's funny. I can go to the bathroom, you know, number one. Much, much better. I'm like, really? That's cool. So that's the first time I've done it. So I, I, I'm calling my mentor. Because I'm like, I want to know about this. And I tell him the story. He's like, well, yeah, you're taking the pressure off that area. The kidney's getting the right nerve supply. You can fix that. And he was scheduled to getting a kidney from his son. And and so my mentor, Dr. Alex, says, 
you better fix him up before they do that because he said that's a risky surgery for the donor, his son, and the dad. I'm like, whew, the pressure's on. He's like, well, you better fix it. So I had him, you know, so I have him come in twice a week and I told him, I showed him on this chart. I said, I think we're helping you with this. I said, I'm taking the pressure off here. And on the chart, you could see what area, what organ was being controlled by the spine. So, so he, he says to me, well, let's do it. How often? So we kept adjusting it. At some point, he said, I think I'm back to normal. He tells his nephrologist, a, a medical doctor who works on the, on the kidneys, he says, I think my vitamins and my chiropractor fixed my kidneys. Could you please check my, um, my kidneys? And the guy's like, well, no, that's crazy. Because when you're on dialysis, he says, you, you, we're, keeping you along, uh, we're keeping you alive long enough so you can get your kidney. This is not gonna, you don't get better on this machine. We're saving your life. So my patient says, hey, I'm going go somewhere else. So he goes to a different di um, nephrologist. The guy examines him and says, you know, you don't really have to go on. This is, the kidneys are working decently enough that you don't need it. No so, kidding. Yeah, so they kept his hose in here, and they did blood tests twice a week for four weeks. And after four weeks, they said, oh, no, that sounds like a miracle. And they removed the port. And, and he gave me a video testimony, and I, I wish I would have known how to film properly it wasn't a good one i didn't have enough light there's one of those old ones with a little you know little, little cassette and stuff but um oh yeah you know the, the old, old like a little old camcorder yeah oh yeah i wish i would have had like an iphone or something mm -hmm. and 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 but basically he celebrated his new birthday that was one year after after the last time he did um, dialysis which was really awesome i was like man that would have been a cool video i wish i would have had it but he was very emotional, and his son was emotional because he called the son and said, you know what, you don't need to give me a kidney. And the son is like, oh, no, Dad, you can have it. He's like, I'll need it. I've got two good ones now. Wow. And I was like, that's oh, that amazing. Been, that would have been a great video on, 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 on TikTok. That would have given me millions of views, you know. But hey, you can still, is it in digital format or was uh, it on a... It wasn't really good. I, I, Do you I still mean, have it? I don't even know if I have that. I don't even know if I have it still. If I mean, you have so, it, you can make that happen. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I would have to really cut it together because... Um, That's easy to do. All you got to do is make it into a digital format okay. and there's converters I'll, for that. I'll, I'll look for it because it was a really nice one. Once it's digital, you just you know? chop it up and yeah. put it together that, in a way that makes sense. And, 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 and my interview style was very awkward too. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, oh, I speak into this thing here. He's like, what now? I'm like, so it was, a, it was very amateur-like, but it was a beautiful thing. So, so I, tell, I call my mentor. I'm like, hey, you know, this is what happened. We were very happy. And he says, the next Gonstadt seminar, so I go to Gonstadt seminars. He says, the next Gonstadt seminar, I want you to teach this. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, I'm in my 30s. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, I'm a rock star. I mean, I got this guy off dialysis, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, and I stand up front. And I, I go a little bit, when I taught this to um, other doctors and, and students, I go into a little bit more detail. I show the x-rays and I show exactly how I adjusted it. <clears throat> I go into good detail. And, you know, they're like... I mean, I feel like I'm a rock star. I get off, and the and the young doctors and the and the students, they all give me high fives, and they're like, man, "Look at you!" And I'm like, "Yes." And then I see older doctors come up to me, and when I say older, they're like my age now, mm -hmm. right? but back then, <laughs> they were the older guys in their fifties, yeah. and they're like, "Hey, good job, young man." No, young, yeah, good, yeah, good. Yeah, that's something like, "Good job, young blood," or something. Yeah. <laughs> After another couple of times, I'm like, "You have?" He's like, "Yeah." Did a lot, and other guys were like, "Yeah, I did that, that, that ten times." I'm like, you "Did? I had no idea that's possible." Yeah, right. I mean, ever since then, it happened a few more times, right? But, and, and I'm not saying that every person on dialysis I would be able to help. But imagine I would get a hundred of them, and I could get two of them off dialysis. It would be fantastic, yeah, that's right? For huge. those two, right? And the money, the money savings, like car packing is so cheap in that sense, right? Yeah. I mean, no, now this guy. His, his, he had an HMO, so he had to pay for my visits. And, back, you know, and he's like, I don't, I don't care, I'll pay twice a week and stuff. Wasn't, they're not expensive. He said, but that dialysis stuff is thousands of yeah. dollars. Not to mention and, a kidney plus the operation. All, all that, right? And then the risk and stuff. Yeah. And mine stuff was just so cheap, right? And I can tell you this, just in <laughs> hindsight, if I, like, I mean, he came for something completely different. He was happy when he left because he said, well, no more headaches and my feet are not numb anymore. So he was happy. And I'm like, Anything else happen? And he's like, well, yeah. And then that's how, that's how it awesome. happened, you know. 
So uh, that's why when every person, when I, any patient who I get as a, you know, anytime I get a patient or so, I examine the whole spine. And sometimes I'm like, well, that goes to the bladder. And I'm like, hey, any bladder problems? They're like, nope. I'm like, well, that's cool. But I still double check that and stuff. And you examine everything. And when you adjust it, often patients say, by the way, you know, it's funny. You were the first visit a year ago, you mentioned something um, about, about, about bladder. You know, I always have those bladder infections, but ever since I've been seeing you, really haven't had that. No, they were fifty percent better and stuff. No, when I, when I said a year, it doesn't mean that you have to come in for a year because that's often when people say, "Well, if you go to chiropractor, you have to come forever." I, you you um, when they come in, you address it until it's corrected. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes in for a low back pain, um, well, it's really. I mean, the thing with visits. this with this type of work is it seems like it's really up to the person to maintain their own body, too, right? If it's really worn down, obviously it takes a little bit longer. If you if you adjust a baby, I, I do that too. That you adjust it, and that's it's um, uh, you know it's often fixed permanently because they haven't yeah. had it that long. So so I'm my youngest patient because often when I, when I when I teach students, they always ask, "What's your what's your oldest patient?" I'm like, "I had a few in the mid '90s." What's your youngest patient? So my youngest patient, what do you think? Take a, take a guess how old? Uh, nine patient. months. Uh, 15 hours. 15 hours. Hours, so same day. So it's a... It's what, a hmm. go what's, ahead, go ahead. what's the parent's indication that there's a spinal issue, or the, or the doctor's even? The, so um, those, this was do, during COVID. So those are two Christian missionaries. They are friends of ours, and they had their baby at home with two midwives. And the baby's neck came out like this. Oh, wow. And it's called toddler collar. So the bent, head was bent to the side, and the mom is like... Doesn't look right, <laughs> and, the, and the, no I don't doubt. know how they said it, but basically oh, I was, be, um, I was um, freaking out. They're like, "Why is this bent?" And they're like, "Well, it's called taller collars, and it usually goes away within the first half year." And the mom was like, hmm, "Can we? Is there something you can do?" And they're like, "Well, a really good chiropractor can do it." Now those two midwives actually knew of me, and then they're like, "Hey, we know this guy, Doctor Stein," and they were like, "Oh, the really tall guy? Yeah, he can do it." So he texts me, he's like, hey, my wife just had to, had a baby. You want to come over right now? I'm like, no, it's five in the morning. And I still have to go to work. And so my, my wife, Claudia, she says, you know what? Tell them we'll come over after practice. And usually I don't do house calls. But they had their first baby at home. I was like, I'm, I'm going to come over. I want to, you know. So I go over there and the baby actually. So the indicator was that the baby was, was able to nurse on one side but couldn't nurse on the other side, okay, right? Okay, yeah. So they, they knew that that's not right, plus the head was like bent in a weird way. So I, obviously, you, you, you look at it, that's my visualization, right? That's, you don't, the instrument doesn't work on the kid, on the baby, because the skin is all stretchy and stuff. So oh. the instrument I couldn't use, I was able to palpate and check if, it, if, if that something felt out of, line, out of alignment, and I was able to see there was some, was actually felt edema. It, was, it looked like it was an indentation in the skin. It's like a little dimple in the bottom of the neck. Hmm. And obviously, they don't take an x-ray. So you, even though we have five tools, I was able to use three of them. Yeah. And I found something, and then I I put my finger on the bone. I went, beep. And the woman was like, that's it? I'm like, I don't know, let's try it out. And the baby immediately was able to nurse on the other side. Wow. So then they were like, hey, come. come. So then we, we went back the next day. They had us over for dinner. So I adjusted the baby one more time, and then they... Two weeks after that, they came in one more time. And after we did the third adjustment, it straightened out. So the baby still had the neck funny, but at least the function was increased. And then later on, the structure changed too. And then I didn't see the baby until maybe a year or two years later, because then um, they moved away, but then they came to visit, and they had a second baby, and they wanted me to check the baby too. So the baby didn't have a problem, and I was supposed to examine the two-year-old, and the two-year-old was all fussy. <laughs> and I'm like... Yeah, Good luck. I'm not gonna fight for her. I'll fight, fight with her. Yeah, they were like, Yeah, this is fine and stuff. So, yeah, so you don't see babies too often, right? But you, but you go and you want to fix it. So, when I adjust somebody for the first time and I adjust it, I usually depends what they have, and it's usually either ear infections or colicky or, or some kind of a sour, upset stomach or some kind of a digestive issue or constipation, any of those things. Once you adjust it, you give it about two weeks and say, you know what, just see how it develops. Let it, give it some time. And then at the earliest, come back in two weeks. And, mm -hmm. and generally they text me, they're like, it's all better. I'm like, perfect. Awesome. So yeah. 
Well, we only have a few minutes left, but I wanted to ask you, yes. I think, one more question. I didn't even get to any of my notes, which is great. This is this is ideal. <laughs> um, but you answered a lot of those questions nice. anyway. So let's see. We got... Oh, yeah. I wanted to kind of give the image of the nervous system related to the spine. It's like a, it's like a water hose. If there's a kink in it, then the water's not going to flow. And that's kind of the same yeah, with the nervous system. A little bit, right, yeah. Generally, and here's a trick. I think that um, Dr. Su, what is Dr. Su, in the 1960s, he did a study, and they said oh, yeah. the, the, the weight of a dime on the nerve root, that's the nerves that exit the spine. So if you have the weight of a dime, it can decrease the nerve output by six, down to 60%, which, which is a very significant thing. And, and so if you have a little bit of pressure, that pressure can now mess with the nerve. And you might not even feel it, but now something else doesn't work right. And you may have an issue where you, and you think, you know, I, I wish you would go to a medical doctor and the medical doctor says, you know, you know, your stomach issue it might come from the spine. Why don't you go and see a chiropractor? I wish that would happen, but it doesn't yeah. happen. No, not so yet. Generally, you know, not yet. Keep I, working actually, sometimes, diligently. Actually, sometimes it does happen. I've had patients who, you know, who already see me and, you know, they see the medical doctor and the medical doctor says, I don't know about that. And they say, well, should I see my chiropractor? And they're like, sure. <laughs> Let's see if he can fix it. Oh, yeah, go. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it happens. Well, the other, um, the, the main question I want to ask is about the feet. I know there's okay. something that uh, people do those. There's like that chart where there's different parts of the feet are connected to different organs and right. such. Uh, do you know anything about that? Or do you find any any validity in that type of acupressure, I think it's called. So, so I, I have some patients. Because the, ner the nerves are all. Yeah, so uh, basically I, I have patients who who are into that. So I have some other practitioners and stuff, and a few nurses and stuff. And some of them are like, hey, you know, this area controls the liver. And I'm like, oh, that could be. So I, I, I never memorized the chart, but I've seen it. And it's, it's possible. I know we learned about it in embryology. They said, well, in the development of here, this can control, control this and this. And it's, it's probably true. Often it's with, with the feet in general, right? You got a bunch of bones in there and sometimes they misalign. Mm. And if they misalign, let's say you roll your ankle, right? And then and let's say that one of the bones, the top bone, so you got a talus that sits on top of the calcaneus, that's the common one. So if you roll your ankle, that bone can misalign. And now it doesn't work properly. It doesn't move properly anymore. So over time... If you're an active guy, you probably mess up the same knee and even the hip over time. And now you have all these issues and stuff. And so when I see somebody, they walk funny, I'm thinking, it could be the hip, but, and I might even adjust the hip as I joined. Yeah. But I might say, no, what happened to your ankle? And you say, well, it's always hurting. And as, then we'll address that too. And if I find it, I adjust it as well. And you try to put it where it belongs. Okay. So, so that's that's what you do in the Gonstead system. So you adjust extremities too. Like I've had people who are like, they fell down. And they hurt their wrist and they go, ah, oh, you know, I'm, I'm diagnosed with carpal tunnel syndrome. And and that's probably legit. Um, the thing though is right before they fell, all the bones, there's eight of them here in the wrist, all those bones moved fine. But once they fell, that bone misaligned. And now it depends on which one, it's usually the scaphoid or the lunate, mainly, mainly the lunate bone here, that when it misaligns backwards, it can put pressure against the, the, the median nerve. And it can cause all those symptoms. Mm. So yes, you could cut that open and shave a piece of the bone off, or you could just try to find that bone and push it back. It's a little easier. Oh, and man. so I've and I've had people, but they're just like, well, my wrist always hurts when I play golf. And I'm like, well, you're not moving it right. And then once you adjust that, they go, oh, that's fantastic. It's supposed to, yeah. So with your understanding of anatomy, mm -hmm. obviously you've followed the nerves from the mm -hmm. spine out throughout the body. And sometimes I've followed the other way. Right. Okay, so then yeah. at the bottom of the feet, are there collections or points of nerves that clearly connect to different organs wow. that you can, that would it, make it, that it, obvious? It probably does, but I don't, I don't look at that. Really looked so into all, all, all I do is, because, you know, like, um, that means if, if you say, you know what, my ankle hurts when I'm walking, I check the ankle, I'm like, hey, this doesn't move right. I adjust it. Just align it. Yeah. Okay. And stuff. It's just possible, you know, but I don't know. Cool. Well, um, I think that's all I've got. Is there anything else you want to share? I wanted to. I want to know basically what's what's, what's your book, book about. Okay, so this is actually cool, right? So I have a over the years I've had several authors, and it's funny. Like when you meet somebody, you're always trying to find something in common. Like when I, when I go, I walk around somewhere, 
and somebody wants to talk to me, or, or you go to a car dealership, they come up to me and they go, "Wow, you're really tall." I have a really tall cousin in Kentucky. Yeah, he's six foot four. We're on the same like, page here, like, aren't we? Well, then <laughs> let, let me okay, let me get my checkbook because I'm going to buy that car from you because we are connected. Yeah, right. So, but I know they're trying to make some kind of connection, get gathered and stuff, right? So, I got patience, and when they say I'm an author, I'm like, oh. And my common thing was just because it's true. I said I always wanted to write a book. So for the last twenty years, I've always wanted to write a book, and. I would sit down, I'm typing something, I'm like writing six, seven, eight pages. I'm like, this is a good story, right? And I'm write a, writing a fun story. And then the next day I read it and I, I'm shocked how bad it is. I'm like, <laughs> are you kidding? I said, what kind of English is that? That's like high school English. I said, this is not good at all. It's a good story, but it's just... So I got these two ladies and they're twins and they live together and work together and they're real authors. They write... They studied that stuff. They wrote several books. They're really good. They know the art of writing books. And I told them that same story. And they said, e email us one of your stories. I'm like, what's an eight-page story? They're like, let's send it. I said, but please don't laugh. They're like, no, we won't laugh. So they, they come back and they go, this is really good. I'm like, well, the English isn't good. I said, well, we fixed that for you. So I wrote the whole book, but they they rewrote it. And oh, okay. So so I, I got I got help with that. So I was really happy with that. And is is this about basically your life story? It, it is. So I'm I'm trying to rela relate relate um, every story in there. So basically, this book is a it's basically you could say it's almost a marketing book. Mm -hmm. So I, I I basically try to answer every question that people ever have about me, Berlin, chiropractic health in general. So I try to answer every one of them. So there's one chapter and, and basically there's one chapter where my, it's a true, they're all true stories where my wife would say, how tall were you as a baby? And I'd be like, well, 23 inches. And she's like, well, that three month old is still shorter than, I was like, yep, I was a pretty big baby. And, and so we were talking about it and I said I was a popular baby because I was a little sturdy, et cetera. But at the end, there's a section where I say, you know, did you know that chiropractic can actually help babies? And I explain why. And there's research to it, too. Okay. So okay. I actually show why that is. <clears throat> but it basically, is, it goes through a... It's, it's an, I read this book three times in a row. You know, like, after, I mean, I, I read it, I wrote it, but I read it three times in a row before we, printing, we printed it. And it's actually, it's an easy read. It's a, it's a fun book to read. Mm -hmm. and the patients who read it, they're like, yeah, this is pretty good. I got to, got to know you, but it's also, it's got some stuff that you actually learn about it, but in a, in a fun way. I'm not just telling you that, oh, adjusting babies is a, can do this and this, because most people are not interested in it. It basically gives you information without you looking for information. Yeah. You know, hey, that guy was 23 inches. Oh, chiropractic can help babies. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. But there's other things too, you know, in there. So it's a, you know, you, know, you tell me. Well, that is called Head and Shoulders Above the Rest. Yes. And yes. your uh, your Instagram is seven, the number seven foot, foot and the number two doc, seven foot two doc. Yeah. And uh, do you Descriptive. have other social medias? Uh, it's the same one also on TikTok. So what I made, the main one is for me, so Instagram and stuff. Just a, it's just a fun one. I, I, there's some, there's some, when people think, well, how do you examine somebody? How do you adjust somebody? I have videos up on my, on my channel. Now, it's also... I've had a few people say, well, I kind of like that kind of chiropractic that you mentioned, but I can't come to see you because I'm too far away or so. Yeah. Right? If you follow me on, on social media and you ask me questions, I'll answer them. Awesome. So if you say, hey, you know what? How can I find somebody who is in Atlanta, Georgia? I'll, I'll, I'll find you somebody. Awesome. You know, because I, I know the Gonstead guys for a while. I used to teach this for, for a couple of years too. And it's a... To me, it's a great technique. So if somebody's doing it, I, I like to support them. And and, and, and you're you. and you're based in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. So, so if you're in Phoenix or somewhere around the greater Phoenix area, people can come to you. Yeah. So it's Glendale. Yeah. It's like where the 101 and 59th Avenue. Oh yeah. And you know, so it's uh, it's, it's actually easy to, easy to find and stuff. It's, it's our office, and yeah, we've been doing this for over two decades, which sounds crazy because. It didn't feel like two decades. It went by fast. But totally. <laughs> totally. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Stein, for your thank time you. and sharing your, your oh, knowledge and your insights and your life story. I appreciate kind. it very much. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Take thank care. Thank you. Thank you.